Section one of From a Swedish Homestead. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. From a Swedish Homestead by Selma Lagerlöf. Translated by Jesse Bruckner. The Story of a Country House. Part one. It was a beautiful autumn day towards the end of the thirties. There was in Uppsala at that time a high yellow two-storied house which stood quite alone in a little meadow on the outskirts of the town. It was a rather desolate and dismal-looking house, but was rendered less so by the Virginia creepers which grew there in profusion, and which had crept so high up the yellow wall on the sunny side of the house that they completely surrounded the three windows on the upper story at one of these windows a student was sitting drinking his morning coffee he was a tall handsome fellow of distinguished appearance his hair was brushed back from his forehead it curled prettily and a lock was continually falling into his eyes he wore a loose comfortable suit but looked rather smart all the same his room was well furnished there was a good sofa and comfortable chairs a large writing table a capital bookcase but hardly any books before he had finished his coffee another student entered the room the newcomer was a totally different looking man he was a short broad-shouldered fellow squarely built and strong ugly with large head thin hair and coarse complexion hede he said i have come to have a serious talk with you has anything unpleasant happened to you oh no not to me the other answered it is really you it concerns he sat silent for a while and looked down it is so awfully unpleasant having to tell you leave it alone then suggested hede he felt inclined to laugh at his friend's solemnity. "'I can't leave it alone any longer,' said his visitor. "'I ought to have spoken to you long ago, but it is hardly my place. You understand? I can't help thinking you will say to yourself, "'There's Gustav Alin, son of one of our cottagers, thinks himself such a great man now that he can order me about.' "'My dear fellow,' Hede said, don't imagine i think anything of the kind my father's father was a peasant's son yes but no one thinks of that now aline answered he sat there looking awkward and stupid resuming every moment more and more of his peasant manners as if that could help him out of his difficulty when i think of the difference there is between your family and mine i feel as if i ought to keep quiet but when i remember that it was your father who by his help in days gone by enabled me to study then i feel that i must speak hede looked at him with a pleasant smile you had better speak out and have done with it he said the thing is aline said i have heard people say that you don't do any work they say you have hardly opened a book during the four terms you have been at the university they say you don't do anything but play on the violin the whole day and that i can quite believe for you never wanted to do anything else when you were at school in falun although there you were obliged to work hede straightened himself a little in his chair aline grew more and more uncomfortable but he continued with stubborn resolution i suppose you think that anyone owning an estate like munkhyttan ought to be able to do as he likes work if he likes or leave it alone if he takes his exam good if he does not take his exam what does it matter for in any case you will never be anything but a landed proprietor and ironmaster you will live at munkhyttan all your life i understand quite well that is what you must think Hede was silent, and Aline seemed to see him surrounded by the same wall of distinction which, in Aline's eyes, had always surrounded his father, the squire, and his mother. But you see, Munkitan is no longer what it used to be when there was iron in the mine, he continued cautiously. The squire knew that very well, 
and that was why it was arranged before his death that you should study your poor mother knows it too and the whole parish knows it the only one who does not know anything is you hede don't you think i know hede said a little irritably that the iron mine cannot be worked any longer oh yes aline said i dare say you know that much but you don't know that it is all up with the property think the matter over and you will understand that one cannot live from farming alone at vesterdalarne i cannot understand why your mother has kept it a secret from you but of course she has the sole control of the estate so she need not ask your advice about anything everybody at home knows that she is hard up they say she drives about borrowing money i suppose she did not want to disturb you with her troubles but thought that she could keep matters going until you had taken your degree she will not sell the estate before you have finished and made yourself a new home hede rose and walked once or twice up and down the floor then he stopped opposite aline but what on earth are you driving at aline do you want to make me believe that we are not rich i know quite well that until lately you have been considered rich people at home aline said but you can understand that things must come to an end when it is a case of always spending and never earning anything it was a different thing when you had the mine hede sat down again my mother would surely have told me if there were anything the matter he said i am grateful to you aline but you have allowed yourself to be frightened by some silly stories i thought that you did not know anything aline continued obstinately at munkhyttan your mother saves and works in order to get the money to keep you at upsala and to make it cheerful and pleasant for you when you are at home in the vacations and in the meantime you are here doing nothing because you don't know there is trouble coming i could not stand any longer seeing you deceiving each other her ladyship thought you were studying and you thought she was rich i could not let you destroy your prospects without saying anything hede sat quietly for a moment and meditated then he rose and gave aline his hand with rather a sad smile you understand that i feel you are speaking the truth even if i will not believe you thank you aline joyfully shook his hand you must know hede that if you will only work no harm is done with your brains you can take your degree in three or four years hede straightened himself do not be uneasy aline he said i am going to work hard now aline rose and went towards the door but hesitated before he reached it he turned round there was something else i wanted he said he again became embarrassed i want you to lend me your violin until you have commenced reading in earnest lend you my violin yes pack it up in a silk handkerchief and put it in the case and let me take it with me or otherwise you will read to no purpose you will begin to play as soon as i am out of the room you are so accustomed to it now you cannot resist if you have it here one cannot get over that kind of thing unless someone helps one it gets the mastery over one hede appeared unwilling this is madness you know he said no hede it is not you know you have inherited it from the squire it runs in your blood ever since you have been your own master here in upsala you have done nothing else but play you live here in the outskirts of the town simply not to disturb any one by your playing you cannot help yourself in this matter let me have the violin well said hede before i could not help playing but now munkhyttan is at stake i am more fond of my home than of my violin but aline was determined and continued to ask for the violin what is the good of it hede said if i want to play i need not go many steps to borrow another violin i know that aline replied but i don't think it would be so bad with another violin 
it is your old italian violin which is the greatest danger for you and besides i would suggest your locking yourself in for the first few days only until you have got fairly started he begged and begged but hede resisted he would not stand anything so unreasonable as being a prisoner in his own room Halin grew crimson i must have the violin with me he said or it is no use at all he spoke eagerly and excitedly i had not intended to say anything about it but i know that it concerns more than munkhyttan i saw a young girl at the promotion ball in the spring who people said was engaged to you i don't dance you know but i like to watch her when she was dancing looking radiant like one of the lilies of the field and when i heard that she was engaged to you i felt sorry for her why because i knew that you would never succeed if you continued as you had begun and then i swore that she should not have to spend her whole life waiting for one who never came she should not sit and wither whilst waiting for you i did not want to meet her in a few years with sharpened features and deep wrinkles round her mouth he stopped suddenly hede's glance had rested so searchingly upon him but gunnar hede had already understood that alin was in love with his fiancee it moved him deeply that alin under these circumstances tried to save him and influenced by this feeling he yielded and gave him the violin when alin had gone hede read desperately for a whole hour but then he threw away his book it was not of much good his reading it would be three or four years before he could be finished and who could guarantee that the estate would not be sold in the meantime he felt almost with terror how deeply he loved the old home it was like witchery every room every tree stood clearly before him he felt he could not part with any of it if he were to be happy and he was to sit quietly with his books whilst all this was about to pass away from him he became more and more restless he felt the blood beating in his temples as if in a fever and then he grew quite beside himself because he could not take his violin and play himself calm again my god he said Aline will drive me mad first to tell me all this and then to take away my violin a man like i must feel the bow between my fingers in sorrow and in joy i must do something i must get money but i have not an idea in my head i cannot think without my violin he could not endure the feeling of being locked in he was so angry with Aline who had thought of this absurd plan that he was afraid he might strike him the next time he came of course he would have played if he had had the violin for that was just what he needed his blood rushed so wildly that he was nearly going out of his mind just as hede was longing most for his violin a wandering musician began to play outside it was an old blind man he played out of tune and without expression but hede was so overcome by hearing a violin just at this moment that he listened with tears in his eyes and with his hands folded the next moment he flung open the window and climbed to the ground by the help of the creepers he had no compunction at leaving his work he thought the violin had simply come to comfort him in his misfortune Hede had probably never before begged so humbly for anything as he did now when he asked the old blind man to lend him his violin he stood the whole time with his cap in his hand although the old man was blind the musician did not seem to understand what he wanted he turned to the young girl who was leading him he had bowed to the poor girl and repeated his request she looked at him as if she must have eyes for them both the glance from her big eyes was so steady that hede thought he could feel where it struck him it began with his collar and it noticed that the frills of his shirt were well starched 
then it saw that his coat was brushed next that his boots were polished hede had never before been subjected to such a close scrutiny he saw clearly that he would not pass muster before those eyes but it was not so all the same the young girl had a strange way of smiling her face was so serious that one had the impression when she smiled that it was the first and only time she had ever looked happy and now one of these rare smiles passed over her lips she took the violin from the old man and handed it to hede play the waltz from freischütz then she said hede thought it was strange that he should have to play a waltz just at that moment but as a matter of fact it was all the same to him what he played if he could only have a bow in his hand that was all he wanted the violin at once began to comfort him it spoke to him in faint cracked tones i'm only a poor man's violin it said but such as i am i am a comfort and help to a poor blind man i am the light and the colour and the brightness in his life it is i who must comfort him in his poverty and old age and blindness hede felt that the terrible depression that has cowed his hopes began to give way you are young and strong the violin said to him you can fight and strive you can hold fast that which tries to escape you why are you downcast and without courage he had played with lowered eyes now he threw back his head and looked at those who stood around him there was quite a crowd of children and people from the street who had come into the yard to listen to the music it appeared however that they had not come solely for the sake of the music the blind man and his companion were not the only ones in the troop opposite hede stood a figure in tights and spangles and with bare arms crossed over his chest he looked old and worn but hede could not help thinking that he looked a devil of a fellow with his high chest and long moustaches and beside him stood his wife a little and fat and not so very young either but beaming with joy over her spangles and flowing gauze skirts during the first bars of the music they stood still and counted then a gracious smile passed over their faces and they took each other's hands and began to dance on a small carpet and hede saw that during all the equilibristic tricks they now performed the woman stood almost still whilst her husband did all the work he sprang over her and twirled round her and vaulted over her the woman scarcely did anything else but kiss her hand to the spectators but hede did not really take much notice of them his bow began to fly over the strings he told him that there was happiness in fighting and overcoming it almost deemed him happy because everything was at stake for him hede stood there playing courage and hope into himself and did not think of the old tightrope dancers but suddenly he saw that they grew restless they no longer smiled they left off kissing their hands to the spectators the acrobat made mistakes and his wife began to sway to and fro in waltz time hede played more and more eagerly he left off freischütz and rushed into an old nixie polka one which generally sent all the people mad when played at the peasant festivals the old tightrope dancers quite lost their heads they stood in breathless astonishment and at last they could resist no longer they sprang into each other's arms and then they began to dance a waltz in the middle of the carpet how they danced dear me how they danced they took small tripping steps and whirled round in a small circle they hardly went outside the carpet and their faces beamed with joy and delight there was the happiness of youth and the rapture of love over these two old people the whole crowd was jubilant at seeing them dance the serious little companion of the blind man smiled all over her face and hede grew much excited just fancy what an effect his violin could have it made people quite forget themselves it was a great power to have at his disposal 
any moment he liked he could take possession of his kingdom only a couple of years study abroad with a great master and he could go all over the world and by his playing earn riches and honor and fame it seemed to hede that these acrobats must have come to tell him this that was the road he should follow it lay before him clear and smooth he said to himself i will i will become a musician i must be one this is better than studying i can charm my fellow-men with my violin i can become rich hede stopped playing the acrobats at once came up and complimented him the man said his name was blomgren this was his real name he had other names when he performed he and his wife were old circus people mrs blomgren in former days had been called miss viola and had performed on horseback and although they had now left the circus they were still true artists artists body and soul that he had probably already noticed that was why they could not resist his violin hede walked about with the acrobats for a couple of hours he could not part with the violin and the old artist's enthusiasm for their profession appealed to him he was simply testing himself i want to find out whether there is the proper stuff for an artist in me i want to see if i can call forth enthusiasm i want to see whether i can make children and idlers follow me from house to house on their way from house to house mr blomgren threw an old threadbare mantle around him and mrs blomgren enveloped herself in a brown cloak thus arrayed they walked at hede's side and talked mr blomgren would not speak of all the honour he and mrs blomgren had received during the time they had performed in a real circus but the director had given mrs blomgren her dismissal under the pretence that she was getting too stout mr blomgren had not been dismissed he had himself resigned his position surely no one could think that mr blomgren would remain with the director who had dismissed his wife mrs blomgren loved her art and for her sake mr blomgren had made up his mind to live as a free artist so that she could still continue to perform during the winter when it was too cold to give performances in the street they performed in a tent they had a very comprehensive repertoire they gave pantomimes and were jugglers and conjurers the circus had cast them off but art had not said mr blomgren they served art always it was well worth being faithful to art even unto death always artists always that was mr blomgren's opinion and it was also mrs blomgren's hede walked quietly and listened his thoughts flew restlessly from plan to plan sometimes events happen which become like symbols like signs which one must obey there must be some meaning in what had now happened to him if he could only understand it rightly it might help him towards arriving at a wise resolution mr blomgren asked the student to notice the young girl who was leading the blind man had he ever before seen such eyes did he not think that such eyes must mean something could one have those eyes without being intended for something great hede turned round and looked at the little pale girl yes she had eyes like stars set in a sad and rather thin face our lord knows always what he is about said mrs blomgren and i also believe that he has some reason for letting such an artist as mr blomgren perform in the street but what was he thinking about when he gave that girl those eyes and that smile i will tell you something said mr blomgren she has not the slightest talent for art and with those eyes hede had a suspicion that they were not talking to him but simply for the benefit of the young girl she was walking just behind them and could hear every word she's not more than thirteen years old and not by any means too old to learn something but impossible impossible without the slightest talent if one does not want to waste one's time sir teach her to sew but not to stand on her head her smile makes people quite mad about her 
mr blomgren continued simply on account of her smile she has had many offers from families wishful to adopt her she could grow up in a well-to-do home if she would only leave her grandfather but what does she want with a smile that makes people mad about her when she will never appear either on horseback or on a trapeze we know other artists said mrs blomgren who pick up children in the street and train them for the profession when they cannot perform any longer themselves there is more than one who has been lucky enough to create a star and obtain immense salaries for her but mr blomgren and i have never thought of the money we have only thought of some day seeing ingrid flying through a hoop whilst the whole circus resounded with applause for us it would have been as if we were beginning life over again why do we keep her grandfather said mr blomgren is he an artist fit for us we could no doubt have got a previous member of a hofkapelle if we had wished but we love that child we cannot do without her we keep the old man for her sake is it not naughty of her that she will not allow us to make an artist of her they said hede turned round the little girl's face wore an expression of suffering and patience he could see that she knew that any one who could not dance on the tightrope was a stupid and contemptible person at the same moment they came to another house but before they began their performance hede sat down on an overturned wheelbarrow and began to preach he defended the poor little girl he reproached mr and mrs blomgren for wishing to hand her over to the great cruel public who would love and applaud her for a time but when she grew old and worn out they would let her trudge along the streets in rain and cold no he or she was artist enough who made a fellow being happy ingrid should only have eyes and smiles for one should keep them for one only and this one should never leave her but give her a safe home as long as he lived tears came into hede's eyes whilst he spoke he spoke more to himself than to the others he felt it suddenly as something terrible to be thrust out into the world to be severed from the quiet home life he saw that the great star-like eyes of the girl began to sparkle it seemed as if she had understood every single word it seemed as if she again felt the right to live but mr blomgren and his wife had become very serious they pressed hede's hand and promised him that they would never again try and persuade the little girl to become an artist she should be allowed to lead the life she wished he had touched them they were artists artists body and soul they understood what he meant when he spoke of love and faithfulness then he departed from them and went home he no longer tried to find any secret meaning in his adventure after all it had meant nothing more than that he should save this poor sorrowful child from always grieving over her incapacity end of section one read by lars rolander Section two of From a Swedish Homestead by Selma Lagerlöf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading Lars Rolander. Section two. The Story of a Country House. Part two. Munkhyttan, the home of Gunnar Hede, was situated in a poor parish in the forests of Vesterdalane. It was a large, thinly populated parish with which nature had dealt very stingily there were stony forest-covered hills and many small lakes the people could not possibly have earned a livelihood there had they not had the right to travel about the country as peddlers but to make up for it the whole of this poor district was full of old tales of how poor peasant lads and lasses had gone into the world with a pack of goods on their backs to return in gilded coaches with the boxes under the seats filled with money one of the very best stories was about hede's grandfather he was the son of a poor musician and had grown up with his violin in his hand and when he was seventeen years old he had gone out into the world with his pack on his back 
but wherever he went his violin had helped him in his business he had by turns gathered people together by his music and sold them silk handkerchiefs combs and pins all his trading had been brought about with music and merriment and things had gone so well with him that he had at last been able to buy munkhyttan with its mine and ironworks from the poverty-stricken baron who then owned the property then he became the squire and the pretty daughter of the baron became his wife from that time the old family as they were always called had thought of nothing else but beautifying the place they removed the main building on to the beautiful island which lay on the edge of a small lake round which lay their fields and their mines the upper story had been added in their time for they wanted to have plenty of room for their numerous guests and they had also added the two large flights of steps outside they had planted ornamental trees all over the fir-covered island they had made small winding pathways in the stony soil and on the most beautiful spots they had built small pavilions hanging like large birds nests over the lake the beautiful french roses that grew on the terrace the dutch furniture the italian violin had all been brought to the house by them and it was they who had built the wall protecting the orchard from the north wind and the conservatory the old family were merry kind-hearted old-fashioned people the squire's wife certainly liked to be a little aristocratic but that was not at all in the old squire's line in the midst of all the luxury which surrounded him he never forgot what he had been and in the room where he transacted his business and where people came and went the pack and the red-painted home-made violin were hung right above the old man's desk even after his death the pack and the violin remained in the same place and every time the old man's son and grandson saw them their hearts swelled with gratitude it was these two poor implements that had created munkhyttan and munkhyttan was the best thing in the world whatever the reason might be and it was probably because it seemed natural to the place that one lived a good genial life there free from trouble hede's family clung to the place with greater love than was good for it and more especially gunnar hede was so strongly attached to it that people said that it was incorrect to say of him that he owned an estate on the contrary it was an old estate in vesterdalarna that owned gunnar hede if he had not made himself a slave of an old rambling manor house and some acres of land and forest and some stunted apple trees he would probably have continued his studies or better still gone abroad to study music which after all was no doubt his proper vocation in this world but when he returned from upsala and it became clear to him that they really would have to sell the estate if he could not soon earn a lot of money he decided upon giving up all his other plans and made up his mind to go out in the world as a peddler as his grandfather before him had done his mother and his fiancée besought him rather to sell the place than to sacrifice himself for it in this manner but he was not to be moved he put on peasant's attire bought goods and began to travel about the country as a peddler he thought that if he only traded a couple of years he could earn enough to pay the debt and save the estate and as far as the latter was concerned he was successful enough but he brought upon himself a terrible misfortune when he had walked about with his pack for a year or so he thought that he would try and earn a large sum of money at one stroke he went far north and bought a large flock of goats about a couple of hundred and he and a comrade intended to drive them down to a large fair in vermland where goats cost twice as much as in the north if he succeeded in selling all his goats he would do a very good business it was in the beginning of november and there had not yet been any snow when hede and his comrade set out with their goats 
The first day everything went well with them, but the second day when they came to the great fifty-mile forest, it began to snow. Much snow fell, and it stormed and blew severely. It was not long before it became difficult for the animals to make their way through the snow. Goats are certainly both plucky and hardy animals, and the herd struggled on for a considerable time. But the snowstorm lasted two days and two nights, and it was terribly cold. Hede did all he could to save the animals, but after the snow began to fall, he could get them neither food nor water and when they had worked their way through deep snow for a whole day they became very footsore their feet hurt them and they would not go any longer the first goat that threw itself down by the roadside and would not get up again and follow the herd he had lifted on to his shoulder so as not to leave it behind but when another and again another lay down he could not carry them there was nothing to do but to look the other way and go on. Do you know what the fifty-mile forest is like? Not a farmhouse, not a cottage mile after mile, only forest, tall stemmed fir trees, with bark as hard as wood, and high branches, no young trees with soft bark and soft twigs that the animals could eat. If there had been no snow, they could have got through the forest in a couple of days. Now they could not get through it at all. All the goats were left there, and the men too nearly perished. They did not meet a single human being the whole time. No one helped them. Hede tried to throw the snow to one side so that the goats could eat the moss, but the snow fell so thickly and the moss was frozen fast to the ground and how could he get food for two hundred animals in this way he bore it bravely until the goats began to moan the first day they were a lively rather noisy herd he had had hard work to make them all keep together and prevent them from butting each other to death but when they seemed to understand that they could not be saved their nature changed and they completely lost their courage they all began to bleat and moan not faintly and peevishly as goats usually do but loudly louder and louder as the danger increased and when hede heard their cries he felt quite desperate they were in the midst of the wild desolate forest there was no help whatever obtainable goat after goat dropped down by the roadside the snow gathered round them and covered them when hede looked back at this row of drifts by the wayside each hiding the body of an animal of which one could still see the projecting horns and the hoofs then his brain began to give way he rushed at the animals which allowed themselves to be covered by the snow swung his whip over them and hit them it was the only way to save them but they did not stir he took them by the horns and dragged them along they allowed themselves to be dragged but they did not move a foot themselves when he let go his hold of their horns they licked his hands as if beseeching him to help them as soon as he went up to them they licked his hands all this had such a strong effect upon hede that he felt he was on the point of going out of his mind it is not certain however that things would have gone so badly with him had he not after it was all over in the forest gone to see one whom he loved dearly it was not his mother but his sweetheart he thought himself that he had gone there because he ought to tell her at once that he had lost so much money that he would not be able to marry for many years but no doubt he went to see her solely to hear her say that she loved him quite as much in spite of his misfortunes he thought that she could drive away the memory of the fifty-mile forest she could perhaps have done this but she would not she was already displeased because hede went about with a pack and looked like a peasant she thought that for that reason alone it was difficult to love him as much as before 
Now, when he told her that he must still go on doing this for many years, she said that she could no longer wait for him. This last blow was too much for Hede. His mind gave way. He did not grow quite mad, however. He retained so much of his senses that he could attend to his business. He even did better than others, for it amused people to make fun of him. He was always welcome at the peasants' houses. People plagued and teased him, but that was in a way good for him, as he was so anxious to become rich. And in the course of a few years he had earned enough to pay all his debts, and he could have lived free from worry on his estate. But this he did not understand. He went about half-witted and silly from farm to farm, and he had no longer any idea to what class of people he really belonged. Raglanda was the name of a parish in the north of East Värmland, near the borders of Dalarne, where the dean had a large house, but the pastor only a small and poor one. But poor as they were at the small parsonage, they had been charitable enough to adopt a poor girl. She was a little girl, Ingrid by name, and she had come to the parsonage when she was thirteen years old. The pastor had accidentally seen her at a fair, where she sat crying outside the tent of some acrobats. He had stopped and asked her why she was crying, and she had told him that her blind grandfather was dead, and that she had no relatives left. She now travelled with a couple of acrobats, and they were good to her, but she cried because she was so stupid that she could never learn to dance on the tightrope and help to earn any money. There was a sorrowful grace over the child which touched the pastor's heart. He said at once to himself that he could not allow such a little creature to go to the bad amongst these wandering tramps. He went into the tent where he saw Mr. and Mrs. Blomgren and offered to take the child home with him. The old acrobats began to weep and said that although the girl was entirely unfitted for the profession, they would so very much like to keep her but at the same time they thought she would be happier in a real home with people who lived in the same place all the year round, and therefore they were willing to give her up to the pastor if he would only promise them that she should be like one of his own children. This he had promised, and from that time the young girl had lived at the parsonage. She was a quiet, gentle child, full of love and tender care for those around her. At first her adopted parents loved her very dearly, but as she grew older she developed a strong inclination to lose herself in dreams and fancies. She lived in a world of visions, and in the middle of the day she could let her work fall and be lost in dreams. But the pastor's wife, who was a clever and hard-working woman, did not approve of this. She found fault with the young girl for being lazy and slow and tormented her by her severity so that she became timid and unhappy when she had completed her nineteenth year she fell dangerously ill they did not quite know what was the matter with her for this happened long ago when there was no doctor at raglanda but the girl was very ill they soon saw she was so ill that she could not live she herself did nothing but pray to god that he would take her away from this world. She would so like to die, she said. Then it seemed as if our Lord would try whether she was in earnest. One night she felt that she grew stiff and cold all over her body, and a heavy lethargy fell upon her. I think this must be death, she said to herself. But the strange thing was that she did not quite lose consciousness. She knew that she lay as if she were dead, knew that they wrapped her in her shroud and laid her in her coffin, but she felt no fear of being buried, although she was still alive. She had but one thought, that she was happy because she was about to die and leave this troublesome life. The only thing she was uneasy about was lest they should discover that she was not really dead and would not bury her. 
life must have been very bitter to her inasmuch as she felt no fear of death whatever but no one discovered that she was living she was conveyed to the church carried to the churchyard and lowered into the grave the grave however was not filled in she had been buried before the service on sunday morning as was the custom at raglanda the mourners had gone into church after the funeral and the coffin was left in the open grave but as soon as the service was over they would come back and help the grave digger to fill in the grave the young girl knew everything that happened but felt no fear she had not been able to make the slightest movement to show that she was alive even if she had wanted to but even if she had been able to move she would not have done so the whole time she was happy because she was as good as dead but on the other hand one could hardly say that she was alive she had neither the use of her mind nor of her senses it was only that part of the soul which dreams dreams during the night that was still living within her she could not even think enough to realize how terrible it would be for her to wake when the grave was filled in she had no more power over her mind than has one who dreams i would like to know she thought if there is anything in the whole wide world that could make me wish to live as soon as that thought rushed through her it seemed to her as if the lid of the coffin and the handkerchief which had been placed over her face became transparent and she saw before her riches and beautiful raiment and lovely gardens with delicious fruits no i don't care for any of these things she said as she closed her eyes for their glories when she again looked up they had disappeared but instead she saw quite distinctly a little angel of god sitting on the edge of the grave good morning thou little angel of god she said to him good morning ingrid the angel said whilst thou art lying here doing nothing i would like to speak a little with thee about days gone by ingrid heard distinctly every word the angel said but his voice was not like anything she had ever heard before it was more like a string instrument it was not like singing but like the tones of a violin or the clang of a harp ingrid the angel said dost thou remember whilst thy grandfather was still living that thou once met a young student who went with thee from house to house playing the whole day on thy grandfather's violin the girl's face was lighted by a smile dost thou think i have forgotten this she said ever since that time no day has passed when i have not thought of him and no night when thou hast not dreamt of him no not a night when i have not dreamt of him and thou wilt die although thou rememberest him so well said the angel then thou wilt never be able to see him again when he said this it was as if the dead girl felt all the happiness of love but even that could not tempt her no no she said i am afraid to live i would rather die then the angel waved his hand and ingrid saw before her a wide waste of desert there were no trees and the desert was barren and dry and hot and extended in all directions without any limits in the sand there lay here and there objects which at the first glance looked like pieces of rock but when she examined them more closely she saw they were the immense living animals of fairy tales with huge claws and great jaws with sharp teeth they lay in the sand watching for prey and between these terrible animals the student came walking along he went quite fearlessly without suspecting that the figures around him were living but warn him do warn him ingrid said to the angel in unspeakable fear tell him that they are living and that he must take care i am not allowed to speak to him said the angel 
with his clear voice, thou must thyself warn him. The apparently dead girl felt with horror that she lay powerless and could not rush to save the student. She made one futile effort after the other to raise herself, but the impotence of death bound her. But then, at last, at last, she felt her heart begin to beat. The blood rushed through her veins. The stiffness of death was loosened in her body. She arose and hastened towards him. End of section 2 Read by Lars Rolander Section 3 of From a Swedish Homestead by Selma Lagerlöf this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by lars rolander section three the story of a country house part three it is quite certain the sun loves the open places outside the small village churches has no one ever noticed that one never sees so much sunshine as during the morning service outside a small whitewashed church nowhere else does one see such radiant streams of light nowhere else is the air so devoutly quiet the sun simply keeps watch that no one remains on the church hill gossiping it wants them all to sit quietly in church and listen to the sermon that is why it sends such a wealth of sunny rays on to the ground outside the church wall perhaps one must not take it for granted that the sun keeps watch outside the small churches every sunday but so much is certain that the morning ingrid had been placed in the grave in the churchyard at raglanda it spread a burning heat over the open space outside the church even the flint stones looked as if they might take fire as they lay and sparkled in the wheel ruts the short down-trodden grass curled so that it looked like dry moss whilst the yellow dandelions which grew amongst the grass spread themselves out on their long stems so that they became as large as asters a man from dalarne came wandering along the road one of those men who go about selling knives and scissors he was clad in a long white sheepskin coat and on his back he had a large black leather pack he had been walking with this burden for several hours without finding it too hot but when he had left the high road and came to the open place outside the church he stopped and took off his hat in order to dry the perspiration from his forehead as the man stood there bareheaded he looked both handsome and clever his forehead was high and white with a deep wrinkle between the eyebrows the mouth was well formed with thin lips his hair was parted in the middle it was cut short at the back but hung over his ears and was inclined to curl he was tall and strongly but not coarsely built in every respect well proportioned but what was wrong about him was his glance which was unsteady and the pupils of his eyes rolled restlessly and were drawn far into the sockets as if to hide themselves there was something drawn about the mouth something dull and heavy which did not seem to belong to the face he could not be quite right either or he would not have dragged that heavy pack about on a sunday if he had been quite in his senses he would have known that it was of no use as he could not sell anything in any case None of the other men from Dalarna who walked about from village to village bent their backs under this burden on a Sunday, but they went to the house of God free and erect as other men. But this poor fellow probably did not know it was a holy day until he stood in the sunshine outside the church and heard the singing. He was sensible enough at once to understand that he could not do any business and then his brain began to work as how he should spend the day he stood for a long time and stared in front of him when everything went its usual course he had no difficulty in managing he was not so bad but that he could go from farm to farm all through the week and attend to his business 
but he never could get accustomed to the sunday that always came upon him as a great unexpected trouble his eyes became quite fixed and the muscles of his forehead swelled the first thought that took shape in his brain was that he should go into the church and listen to the singing but he would not accept this suggestion he was very fond of singing but he dared not go into the church he was not afraid of human beings but in some churches there were such quaint uncanny pictures which represented creatures of which he would rather not think at last his brain worked round to the thought that as this was a church there would probably also be a churchyard and when he could take refuge in a churchyard all was well one could not offer him anything better if on his wanderings he saw a churchyard he always went in and sat there a while even if it were in the middle of a workday week now that he wanted to go to the churchyard a new difficulty suddenly arose the burial place at raglanda does not lie quite near the church which is built on a hill but on the other side of the road and he could not get to the entrance of the churchyard without passing along the road where the horses of the churchgoers were standing tied up all the horses stood with their heads deep in bundles of hay and nose-bags chewing there was no question of their being able to do the man any harm but he had his own ideas as to the danger of going past such a long row of animals two or three times he made an attempt but his courage failed him so that he was obliged to turn back he was not afraid that the horses would bite or kick it was quite enough for him that they were so near that they could see him it was quite enough that they could shake their bridles and scrape the earth with their hoofs at last a moment came when all the horses were looking down and seemed to be eating for a wager then he began to make his way between them he held his sheepskin cloak tightly round him so that it should not flap and betray him and he went on tiptoe as lightly as he could when a horse raised its eyelid and looked at him he at once stopped and curtsied he wanted to be polite in this great danger but surely animals were amenable to reason and could understand that he could not bow when he had a pack full of hardware upon his back he could only curtsy he sighed deeply for in this world it was a sad and troublesome thing to be so afraid of all four-footed animals as he was he was really not afraid of any other animals than goats and he would not have been at all afraid of horses and dogs and cats had he only been quite sure that they were not a kind of transformed goats but he never was quite sure of that so as a matter of fact it was just as bad for him as if he had been afraid of all kinds of four-footed animals it was no use his thinking of how strong he was and that these small peasant horses never did any harm to any one he who has become possessed of such fears cannot reason with himself fear is a heavy burden and it is hard for him who must always carry it it was strange that he managed to get past all the horses the last few steps he took in two long jumps and when he got into the churchyard he closed the gate after him and began to threaten the horses with his clenched fist you wretched miserable accursed goats he did that to all animals he could not help calling them goats and that was very stupid of him for it had procured him a name which he did not like every one who met him called him the goat but he would not own to his name he wanted to be called by his proper name but apparently no one knew his real name in that district he stood a little while at the gate rejoicing at having escaped from the horses but he soon went further into the churchyard at every cross and every stone he stopped and curtsied but this was not from fear this was simply from joy at seeing these dear old friends 
All at once he began to look quite gentle and mild. They were exactly the same crosses and stones he had so often seen before. They looked just as usual. How well he knew them again. He must say good morning to them. How nice it was in the churchyard. There were no animals about there, and there were no people to make fun of him. It was best there when it was quite quiet as now, but even if there were people, they did not disturb him. He certainly knew many pretty meadows and woods, which he liked still better, but there he was never left in peace. They could not by any means compare with the churchyard, and the churchyard was better than the forest, for in the forest the loneliness was so great that he was frightened by it. Here it was quiet as in the depths of the forest, but he was not without company. Here people were sleeping under every stone and every mound, just the company he wanted in order not to feel lonely and strange. He went straight to the open grave. He went there partly because there were some shady trees, and partly because he wanted company. He thought perhaps that the dead who had so recently been laid in the grave might be a better protection against his loneliness than those who had passed away long ago he bent his knees with his back to the great mound of earth at the edge of the grave and succeeded in pushing the pack upwards so that it stood firmly on the mound and he then loosened the heavy straps that fastened it it was a great day a holiday he also took off his coat he sat down on the grass with a feeling of great pleasure so close to the grave that his long legs with the stockings tied under the knee and the heavy laced shoes dangled over the edge of the grave for a while he sat still with his eyes steadily fixed upon the coffin when one was possessed by such fear as he was one could not be too careful but the coffin did not move in the least it was impossible to suspect it of containing any snare he was no sooner certain of this than he put his hand into a side pocket of the pack and took out a violin and bow and at the same time he nodded to the dead in the grave as he was so quiet he should hear something pretty this was something very unusual for him there were not many who were allowed to hear him play no one was ever allowed to hear him play at the farms where they set the dogs at him and called him the goat but sometimes he would play in a house where they spoke softly and went about quietly and did not ask him if he wanted to buy any goatskins at such places he took out his violin and treated them to some music and this was a great favour the greatest he could bestow upon anybody as he sat there and played at the edge of the grave it did not sound amiss he did not play a wrong note and he played so softly and gently that it could hardly be heard at the next grave the strange thing about it was that it was not the man who could play but it was his violin that could remember some small melodies they came forth from the violin as soon as he let the bow glide over it it might not perhaps have meant so much to others but for him who could not remember a single tune it was the most precious gift of all to possess such a violin that could play by itself whilst he played he sat with a beaming smile on his face it was the violin that spoke and spoke he only listened was it not strange that one heard all these beautiful things as soon as one let the bow glide over the strings the violin did that it knew how it ought to be and the dollar man only sat and listened melodies grew out of that violin as grass grows out of the earth no one could understand how it happened our lord had ordered it so the dollar man intended to remain sitting there the whole day and let the dear tunes grow out of the violin like small white and many-coloured flowers he would play a whole meadow full of flowers play a whole long valley full a whole wide plain 
but she who lay in the coffin distinctly heard the violin and upon her it had a strange effect the tones had made her dream and what she had seen in her dreams caused her such emotion that her heart began to beat her blood to flow and she awoke but all she had lived through while she lay there apparently dead the thoughts she had had and also her last dream everything vanished in the same moment she awoke to consciousness she did not even know that she was lying in her coffin but thought she was still lying ill at home in her bed she only thought it strange that she was still alive a little while ago before she fell asleep she had been in the pangs of death surely all must have been over with her long ago she had taken leave of her adopted parents and of her brothers and sisters and of the servants the dean had been there himself to administer the last communion for her adopted father did not think he could bear to give it to her himself for several days she had put away all earthly thoughts from her mind it was incomprehensible that she was not dead she wondered why it was so dark in the room where she lay there had been a light all the other nights during her illness and then they had let the blankets fall off the bed she was lying there getting as cold as ice she raised herself a little to pull the blankets over her in doing so she knocked her head against the lid of the coffin and fell back with a little scream of pain she had knocked herself rather severely and immediately became unconscious again she lay as motionless as before and it seemed as if life had again left her the dollar man who had heard both the knock and the cry immediately laid down his violin and sat listening but there was nothing more to be heard nothing whatever he began again to look at the coffin as attentively as before he sat nodding his head as if he would say yes to what he was himself thinking about namely that nothing in this world was to be depended upon here he had had the best and most silent of comrades but had he not also been disappointed in him he sat and looked at the coffin as if trying to see right through it at last when it continued quite still he took his violin again and began to play but the violin would not play any longer however gently and tenderly he drew his bow there came forth no melody this was so sad that he was nearly crying he had intended to sit still and listen to his violin the whole day and now it would not play any more he could quite understand the reason the violin was uneasy and afraid of what had moved in the coffin it had forgotten all its melodies and thought only what it could be that had knocked at the coffin lid that is how it is one forgets everything when one is afraid he saw that he would have to quiet the violin if he wanted to hear more he had felt so happy more so than for many years if there was really anything bad in the coffin would it not be better to let it out then the violin would be glad and beautiful flowers would again grow out of it he quickly opened his big pack and began to rummage amongst his knives and saws and hammers until he found a screwdriver in another moment he was down in the grave on his knees and unscrewing the coffin lid he took out one screw after the other until at last he could raise the lid against the side of the grave at the same moment the handkerchief fell off the face of the apparently dead girl as soon as the fresh air reached ingrid she opened her eyes now she saw that it was light they must have removed her now she was lying in a yellow chamber with a green ceiling and a large chandelier was hanging from the ceiling the chamber was small but the bed was still smaller why had she the sensation of her arms and legs being tied was it because she should lie still in the little narrow bed it was strange that they had placed a hymn book under her chin they only did that with corpses between her fingers she had a little bouquet 
her adopted mother had cut a few sprigs from her flowering myrtle and laid them in her hands ingrid was very much surprised what had come to her adopted mother she saw that they had given her a pillow with broad lace and a fine hem-stitched sheet she was very glad of that she liked to have things nice still she would rather have had a warm blanket over her it could surely not be good for a sick person to lie without a blanket ingrid was nearly putting her hands to her eyes and beginning to cry she was so bitterly cold at the same moment she felt something hard and cold against her cheek she could not help smiling it was the old red wooden horse the old three-legged camilla that lay beside her on the pillow her little brother who could never sleep at night without having it with him in his bed had put it in her bed it was very sweet of her little brother ingrid felt still more inclined to cry when she understood that her little brother had wanted to comfort her with his wooden horse but she did not get so far as crying the truth all at once flashed upon her her little brother had given her the wooden horse and her mother had given her her white myrtle flowers and the hymn book had been placed under her chin because they had thought she was dead ingrid took hold of the sides of the coffin with both hands and raised herself the little narrow bed was a coffin and the little narrow chamber was a grave it was all very difficult to understand she could not understand that this concerned her that it was she who had been swathed like a corpse and placed in the grave she must be lying all the same in her bed and be seeing or dreaming all this she would soon find out that this was no reality but that everything was as usual all at once she found the explanation of the whole thing i often have such strange dreams this is only a vision and she sighed relieved and happy she laid herself down in her coffin again she was so sure that it was her own bed for that was not very wide either all this time the dollar man stood in the grave quite close to the foot of the coffin he only stood a few feet from her but she had not seen him that was probably because he had tried to hide himself in the corner of the grave as soon as the dead in the coffin had opened her eyes and begun to move she could perhaps have seen him although he held the coffin lid before him as a screen had there not been something like a white mist before her eyes so that she could only see things quite near her distinctly ingrid could not even see that there were earthen walls around her she had taken the sun to be a large chandelier and the shady lime trees for a roof the poor dollar man stood and waited for the thing that moved in the coffin to go away it did not strike him that it would not go unrequested had it not knocked because it wanted to get out he stood for a long time with his head behind the coffin lid and waited that he should go he peeped over the lid when he thought that now it must have gone but it had not moved it remained lying on its bed of shavings he could not put up with it any longer he must really make an end of it it was a long time since his violin had spoken so prettily as to-day he longed to sit again quietly with it ingrid who had nearly fallen asleep again suddenly heard herself addressed in the die sing-song dollar dialect now i think it is time you go up as soon as he had said this he hid his head he shook so much over his boldness that he nearly let the lid fall but the white mist which had been before ingrid's eyes disappeared completely when she heard a human being speaking she saw a man standing in the corner at the foot of the coffin holding a coffin lid before him she saw at once that she could not lie down again and think it was a vision surely he was a reality which he must try and make out it certainly looked as if the coffin were a coffin and the grave a grave and that she herself a few minutes ago was nothing but a swathed and buried corpse for the first time she was terror-stricken at what had happened to her to think that she could really have been dead that moment she could have been a hideous corpse food for worms 
she had been placed in the coffin for them to throw earth upon her she was worth no more than a piece of turf she had been thrown aside altogether the worms were welcome to eat her no one would mind about that ingrid needed so badly to have a fellow creature near her in her great terror she had recognized the goat directly he put up his head he was an old acquaintance from the parsonage she was not in the least afraid of him she wanted him to come close to her she did not mind in the least that he was an idiot he was at any rate a living being she wanted him to come so near to her that she could feel she belonged to the living and not to the dead oh for god's sake come close to me she said with tears in her voice she raised herself in the coffin and stretched out her arms to him but the dalar man only thought of himself if she were so anxious to have him near her he resolved to make his own terms yes he said if you will go away ingrid at once tried to comply with his request but she was so tightly swathed in the sheet that she found it difficult to get up you must come and help me she said she said this partly because she was obliged to do it and partly because she was afraid that she had not quite escaped death she must be near someone living he actually went near her squeezing himself between the coffin and the side of the grave he bent over her lifted her out of the coffin and put her down on the grass at the side of the open grave ingrid could not help it she threw her arms round his neck laid her head on his shoulder and sobbed afterwards she could not understand how she had been able to do this and that she was not afraid of him it was partly from joy that he was a human being a living human being and partly from gratitude because he had saved her what would have become of her if it had not been for him it was he who had raised the coffin lid who had brought her back to life she certainly did not know how it had all happened but it was surely he who had opened the coffin what would have happened to her if he had not done this she would have awakened to find herself imprisoned in the black coffin she would have knocked and shouted but who would have heard her six feet below the ground ingrid dared not think of it she was entirely absorbed with gratitude because she had been saved she must have someone she could thank she must lay her head on someone's breast and cry from gratitude the most extraordinary thing almost that happened that day was that the dalar man did not repulse her but it was not quite clear to him that she was alive he thought she was dead and he knew it was not advisable to offend anyone dead but as soon as he could manage he freed himself from her and went down into the grave again he placed the lid carefully on the coffin put in the screws and fastened it as before then he thought the coffin would be quite still and the violin would regain its peace and its melodies in the meantime ingrid sat on the grass and tried to collect her thoughts she looked towards the church and discovered the horses and the carriages on the hillside then she began to realize everything it was sunday they had placed her in the grave in the morning and now they were in church a great fear now seized ingrid the service would perhaps soon be over and then all the people would come out and see her and she had nothing on but a sheet she was almost naked fancy if all the people came and saw her in this state they would never forget the sight and she would be ashamed of it all her life where should she get some clothes for a moment she thought of throwing the dalarman's fur coat round her but she did not think that that would make her any more like other people she turned quickly to the crazy man who was still working at the coffin lid oh she said will you let me creep into your pack in a moment she stood by the great leather pack which contained goods enough to fill a whole market stall and began to open it you must come and help me she did not ask in vain when the dollar man saw her touching his wares he came up at once are you touching my pack 
he asked threateningly ingrid did not notice he spoke angrily she considered him to be her best friend all the time oh dear good man she said help me to hide so that people will not see me put your ware somewhere or other and let me creep into the pack and carry me home oh do do it i live at the parsonage and it is only a little way from here you know where it is the man stood and looked at her with stupid eyes she did not know whether he had understood a word of what she said she repeated it but he made no sign of obeying her she began again to take the things out of the pack then he stamped on the ground and tore the pack from her however should ingrid be able to make him do what she wanted on the grass beside her lay a violin and a bow she took them up mechanically she did not know herself why she had probably been so much in the company of people playing the violin that she could not bear to see an instrument lying on the ground as soon as she touched the violin he let go the pack and tore the violin from her he was evidently quite beside himself when any one touched his violin he looked quite malicious what in the world could she do to get away before people came out of church she began to promise him all sorts of things just as one promises children when one wants them to be good i will ask father to buy a whole dozen of sights from you i will lock up all the dogs when you come to the parsonage i will ask mother to give you a good meal but there was no sign of his giving way she bethought herself of the violin and said in her despair if you will carry me to the parsonage i will play for you at last a smile flashed across his face that was evidently what he wanted i will play for you the whole afternoon i will play for you as long as you like will you teach the violin new melodies he asked of course i will but ingrid now became both surprised and unhappy for he took hold of the pack and pulled it towards him he dragged it over the graves and the sweet williams and southern wood that grew on them were crushed under it as if it were a roller he dragged it to a heap of branches and wizened leaves and old rest lying near the wall round the churchyard there he took all the things out of the pack and hid them well under the heap when it was empty he returned to ingrid now you can get in he said ingrid stepped into the pack and crouched down on the wooden bottom the man fastened all the straps as carefully as when he went about with his usual wares bent down so that he nearly went on his knees put his arms through the braces buckled a couple of straps across his chest and stood up when he had gone a few steps he began to laugh his pack was so light that he could have danced with it it was only about a mile from the church to the parsonage the dollar man could walk it in twenty minutes ingrid's only wish was that he would walk so quickly that she could get home before the people came back from church she could not bear the idea of so many people seeing her she would like to get home when only her mother and the maid-servants were there ingrid had taken with her the little bouquet of flowers from her adopted mother's myrtle she was so pleased with it that she kissed it over and over again it made her think more kindly of her adopted mother than she had ever done before but in any case she would of course think kindly of her now one who has come straight from the grave must think kindly and gently of everything living and moving on the face of the earth she could now understand so well that the pastor's wife was bound to love her own children more than her adopted daughter and when they were so poor at the parsonage that they could not afford to keep a nursemaid she could see now that it was quite natural that she should look after her little brothers and sisters and when her brothers and sisters were not good to her it was because they had become accustomed to think of her as their nurse it was not so easy for them to remember that she had come to the parsonage to be their sister and after all it all came from their being poor when father some day got another living and became dean or even rector everything would surely come right 
then they would love her again as they did when she first came to them the good old times would be sure to come back again ingrid kissed her flowers it had not been mother's intention perhaps to be hard it was only worry that had made her so strange and unkind but now it would not matter how unkind they were to her in the future nothing could hurt her for now she would always be glad simply because she was alive and if things should ever be really bad again she would only think of mother's myrtle and her little brother's horse it was happiness enough to know that she was being carried along the road alive this morning no one had thought that she would ever again go over these roads and hills and the fragrant clover and the little birds singing and the beautiful shady trees which had all been a source of joy for the living had not even existed for her but she had not much time for reflection for in twenty minutes the dollar man had reached the parsonage no one was at home but the pastor's wife and the maid-servants just as ingrid had wished the pastor's wife had been busy the whole morning cooking for the funeral feast she soon expected the guests and everything was nearly ready she had just been into the bedroom to put on her black dress she glanced down the road to the church but there were still no carriages to be seen so she went once again into the kitchen to taste the food she was quite satisfied for everything was as it ought to be and one cannot help being glad for that even if one is in mourning there was only one maid in the kitchen and that was the one the pastor's wife had brought with her from her old home so she felt she could speak to her in confidence i must confess lisa she said i think any one would be pleased with having such a funeral if she could only look down and see all the fuss you make of her lisa said she would be pleased ah said the pastor's wife i don't think she would ever be pleased with me she's dead now said the girl and i'm not the one to say anything against one who is hardly yet under the ground i've had to bear many a hard word from my husband for her sake said the mistress the pastor's wife felt she wanted to speak with someone about the dead girl her conscience had pricked her a little on her account and this was why she had arranged such a grand funeral feast she thought her conscience might leave her alone now she had had so much trouble over the funeral but it did not do so by any means her husband also reproached himself and said that the young girl had not been treated like one of their own children and that they had promised she should be when they adopted her and he said it would have been better if they had never taken her when they could not help letting her see that they loved their own children more and now the pastor's wife felt she must talk to someone about the young girl to hear whether people thought she had treated her badly she saw that lisa began to stir the pan violently as if she had difficulty in controlling her anger she was a clever girl who thoroughly understood how to get into her mistress's good books i must say lisa began that when one has a mother who always looks after one and takes care that one is neat and clean one might at least try to obey and please her and when one is allowed to live in a good parsonage and to be educated respectably one ought at least to give some return for it and not always go idling about and dreaming i should like to know what would have happened if you had not taken the poor thing in i suppose she would have been running about with those acrobats and have died in the streets like any other poor wretch a man from dalarna came across the yard he had his pack on his back although it was sunday he came very quietly through the open kitchen door and curtsied when he entered but no one took any notice of him both the mistress and the maid saw him but as they knew him they did not think it necessary to interrupt their conversation the pastor's wife was anxious to continue it she felt she was about to hear what she needed to ease her conscience it is perhaps as well she is gone she said yes ma'am the servant said eagerly and i'm sure the pastor thinks just the same 
in any case he soon will and the mistress will see that now there will be more peace in the house and i am sure the master needs it oh said the pastor's wife i was obliged to be careful then there were always so many clothes to be got for her that it was quite dreadful he was so afraid that she should not get as much as the others that she sometimes even had more and it cost so much now that she was grown up i suppose ma'am greta will get her muslin dress yes either greta will have it or i shall use it myself she does not leave much behind her poor thing no one expects her to leave anything said her adopted mother i should be quite content if i could remember ever having had a kind word from her this is only the kind of thing one says when one has a bad conscience and wants to excuse oneself her adopted mother did not really mean what she said the dollar man behaved exactly as he always did when he came to sell his wares he stood for a little while looking round the kitchen then he slowly pushed the pack on to a table and unfastened the braces and the straps then he looked round to see if there were any cats or dogs about he then straightened his back and began to unfasten the two leather flaps which were fastened with numerous buckles and knots he need not trouble about opening his pack to-day lisa said it is sunday and he knows quite well we don't buy anything on sundays she however took no notice of the crazy fellow who continued to unfasten his straps she turned round to her mistress this was a good opportunity for insinuating herself i don't even know whether she was good to the children i often heard them cry in the nursery i suppose it was the same with them as it was with their mother said the pastor's wife but now of course they cry because she is dead they don't understand what is best for them said the servant but the mistress can be certain that before a month is gone there will be no one to cry over her at the same moment they both turned round from the kitchen range and looked towards the table where the dollar man stood opening his big pack they had heard a strange noise something like a sigh or a sob the man was just opening the inside lid and out of the pack rose the newly buried girl exactly the same as when they laid her in the coffin and yet she did not look quite the same she looked almost more dead now than when she was laid in her coffin then she had nearly the same colour as when she was alive now her face was ashy grey there was a bluish-black shadow round her mouth and her eyes lay deep in her head she said nothing but her face expressed the greatest despair and she held out beseechingly and as if to avert their anger the bouquet of mitral which she had received from her adopted mother this sight was more than flesh and blood could stand her mother fell fainting to the ground the maid stood still for a moment gazing at the mother and daughter covered her eyes with her hands and rushed into her own room and locked the door it is not me she has come for this does not concern me but ingrid turned round to the dollar man put me in your pack again and take me away do you hear take me away take me back to where you found me the dollar man happened to look through the window a long row of carts and carriages was coming up the avenue and into the yard ah indeed then he was not going to stay he did not like that at all ingrid crouched down at the bottom of the pack she said not another word but only sobbed the flaps and the lids were fastened and she was again lifted on to his back and carried away those who were coming to the funeral feast laughed at the goat who hastened away curtsying and curtsying to every horse he met end of section three read by lars rolander section four of from a swedish homestead by selma lagerlöf this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by lars rolander section four the story of a country house part four 
Anna Stina was an old woman who lived in the depths of the forest. She gave a helping hand at the parsonage now and then, and always managed opportunely to come down the hillside when they were baking or washing. She was a nice, clever old woman, and she and Ingrid were good friends. As soon as the young girl was able to collect her thoughts, she made up her mind to take refuge with her. Listen, she said to the dollar man, when you get on to the high road, turn into the forest, then go straight on until you come to a gate. There you must turn to the left, then you must go straight on until you come to the large gravel pit. From there you can see a house. Take me there, and I will play to you. The short and harsh manner in which she gave her order jarred upon her ears, but she was obliged to speak in this way in order to be obeyed. It was the only chance she had. What right had she to order another person about? she who had not even the right to be alive after all this she would never again be able to feel as if she had any right to live this was the most dreadful part of all that had happened to her that she could have lived in the parsonage for six years and not even been able to make herself so much loved that they wished to keep her alive and those whom no one loves have no right to live she could not exactly say how she knew it was so but it was as clear as daylight she knew it from the feeling that the same moment she heard that they did not care about her an iron hand seemed to have crushed her heart as if to make it stop yes it was life itself that had been closed for her and the same moment she had come back from death and felt the delight of being alive burn brightly and strongly within her just at that moment the one thing that gave her the right of existing had been torn from her this was worse than sentence of death it was much more cruel than an ordinary sentence of death she knew what it was like it was like felling a tree not in the usual manner when the trunk is cut through but by cutting its root and leaving it standing in the ground to die by itself there the tree stands and cannot understand why it no longer gets nourishment and support it struggles and strives to live but the leaves get smaller and smaller it sends forth no fresh shoots the bark falls off and it must die because it is severed from the spring of life thus it is it must die at last the dollar man put down his pack on the stone step outside a little house in the midst of the wild forest the door was locked but as soon as ingrid had got out of the pack she took the key from under the doorstep opened the door and walked in ingrid knew the house thoroughly and all it contained it was not the first time she had come there for comfort it was not the first time she had come and told old anna Stina that she could not bear living at home any longer that her adopted mother was so hard to her that she would not go back to the parsonage but every time she came the old woman had talked her over and quieted her she had made her some terrible coffee from roasted peas and chicory without a single coffee bean in it but which had all the same given her new courage and in the end she had made her laugh at everything and encouraged her so much that she had simply danced down the hillside on her way home even if anna stina had been at home and had made some of her terrible coffee it would probably not have helped ingrid this time but the old woman was down at the parsonage to the funeral feast for the pastor's wife had not forgotten to invite any of those of whom ingrid had been fond that too was probably the result of an uneasy conscience but in anna's room everything was as usual and when ingrid saw the sofa with the wooden seat and the clean score table and the cat and the coffee kettle although she did not feel comforted or cheered she felt that here was a place where she could give vent to her sorrow it was a relief that here she need not think of anything but crying and moaning she went straight to the settle threw herself on the wooden seat and lay there crying 
she did not know for how long. The Dalar man sat outside on the stone step. He did not want to go into the house on account of the cat. He expected that Ingrid would come out and play to him. He had taken the violin out long ago. As it was such a long time before she came, he began to play himself. He played softly and gently, as was his wont. It was barely possible for the young girl to hear him playing. Ingrid had one fit of shivering after the other. This was how she had been before she fell ill. She would no doubt be ill again. It was also best that the fever should come and put an end to her in earnest. When she heard the violin, she rose and looked round with bewildered glance. Who was that playing? Was that her student? Had he come at last? It soon struck her, however, that it was the dollar man, and she lay down again with a sigh. She could not follow what he was playing, but as soon as she closed her eyes, the violin assumed the student's voice. She also heard what he said. He spoke with her adopted mother and defended her. He spoke just as nicely as he had done to Mr. and Mrs. Blomgren. Ingrid needed love so much, he said. That was what she had missed. That was why she had not always attended to her work, but allowed dreams to fill her mind. But no one knew how she could work and slave for those who loved her. For their sake she could bear sorrow and sickness and contempt and poverty. For them she would be as strong as a giant and as patient as a slave. Ingrid heard him distinctly, and she became quiet. Yes, it was true. If only her adopted mother had loved her, she would have seen what Ingrid was worth. But as she did not love her, Ingrid was paralyzed in her efforts. Yes, so it had been. Now the fever had left her. She only lay and listened to what the student said. She slept a little now and then. Time after time she thought she was lying in her grave, and then it was always the student who came and took her out of the coffin. She lay and disputed with him. When I am dreaming, it is you who come, she said. It is always I who come to you, Ingrid, he said. I thought you knew that. I take you out of the grave. I carry you on my shoulders. I play you to sleep. It is always I. What disturbed and awoke her was the thought that she had to get up and play for the dollar man. Several times she rose up to do it, but could not. As soon as she fell back upon the settle, she began to dream. She sat crouching in the pack, and the student carried her through the forest. It was always he. But it was not you, she said to him. Of course it was I, he said, smiling at her, contradicting him. You have been thinking about me every day for all these years, so you can understand I could not help saving you when you were in such great danger. Of course she saw the force of his argument, and then she began to realize that he was right and that it was he. But this was such infinite bliss that she again awoke. Love seemed to fill her whole being. It could not have been more real had she seen and spoken with her beloved. Why does he never come in real life? she said half aloud. Why does he only come in my dreams? She did not dare to move, for then love would fly away. It was as if a timid bird had settled on her shoulder, and she was afraid of frightening it away. If she moved, the bird would fly away, and sorrow would overcome her. When at last she really awoke, it was twilight. She must have slept the whole afternoon and evening. At that time of the year, it was not dark until after ten o'clock. The violin had ceased playing, and the dollar man had probably gone away. Anna Stina had not yet come back. She would probably be away the whole night. It did not matter to Ingrid. All she wanted was to lie down again and sleep. She was afraid of all the sorrow and despair that would overwhelm her as soon as she awoke. 
But then she got something new to think about. Who could have closed the door? Who had spread Anastina's great shawl over her? And who had placed a piece of dry bread beside her on the seat? Had he, the goat, done all this for her? For a moment she thought she saw dream and reality standing side by side, trying which could best console her. And the dream stood joyous and smiling, showering over her all the bliss of love to comfort her. But life, poor, hard, and bitter though it was, also brought its kindly little might to show that it did not mean to be so hard upon her as perhaps she thought. Ingrid and Anna Stina were walking through the dark forest. They had been walking for four days and had slept three nights in the Sater huts. Ingrid was weak and weary. Her face was transparently pale. Her eyes were sunken and shone feverishly. Old Anna Stina now and then secretly cast an anxious look at her and prayed to God that he would sustain her so that she might not die by the wayside. Now and then the old woman could not help looking behind her with uneasiness. She had an uncomfortable feeling that the old man with his sight came stealthily after them through the forest to reclaim the young girl who, both by the word of God and the casting of earth upon her, had been consecrated to him. Old Anastina was little and broad, with large square face, which was so intelligent that it was almost good-looking. She was not superstitious. She lived quite alone in the midst of the forest, without being afraid either of witches or evil spirits. But as she walked there by the side of Ingrid, she felt as distinctly as if someone had told her that she was walking beside a being who did not belong to this world. She had had that sensation ever since she had found Ingrid lying in her house that Monday morning. Anna Stina had not returned home on the Sunday evening, for down at the parsonage the pastor's wife had been taken very ill, and Anna Stina, who was accustomed to nurse sick people, had stayed to sit up with her. The whole night she had heard the pastor's wife raving about Ingrid's having appeared to her, but that the old woman had not believed. And when she returned home the next day and found Ingrid, the old woman would at once have gone down to the parsonage again to tell them that it was not a ghost they had seen. But when she had suggested this to Ingrid, it had affected her so much that she dared not do it. It was as if the little life which burnt in her would be extinguished just as the flame of a candle is put out by too strong a draught. She could have died as easily as a little bird in its cage. Death was prowling around her. There was nothing to be done but to nurse her very tenderly and deal very gently with her if her life was to be preserved. The old woman hardly knew what to think of Ingrid. Perhaps she was a ghost. There seemed to be so little life in her. She quite gave up trying to talk her to reason. There was nothing else for it but giving in to her wishes that no one should hear anything about her being alive. And then the old woman tried to arrange everything as wisely as possible. She had a sister who was housekeeper on a large estate in Dalarne, and she made up her mind to take Ingrid to her and persuade her sister Stava to give the girl a situation at the manor house. Ingrid would have to be content with being simply a servant. There was nothing else for it. They were now on their way to the manor house. Anna Stina knew the country so well that they were not obliged to go by the high road, but could follow the lonely forest paths. But they had also undergone much hardship. Their shoes were worn and in pieces, their skirts soiled and frayed at the bottom, and a branch had torn a long rent in Ingrid's sleeve. On the evening of the fourth day they came to a hill from which they could look down into a deep valley. In the valley was a lake, 
and near the edge of the lake was a high rocky island upon which stood a large white building when anna stina saw the house she said it was called munkhyttan and that it was there her sister lived they made themselves as tidy as they could on the hillside they arranged the handkerchiefs which they wore on their heads dried their shoes with moss and washed themselves in a forest stream and anna stina tried to make a fold in ingrid's sleeve so that the rent could not be seen the old woman sighed when she looked at ingrid and quite lost courage it was not only that she looked so strange in the clothes she had borrowed from anna stina and which did not at all fit her but her sister stava would never take her into her service she looked so wretched and pitiful it was like engaging a breath of wind the girl could be of no more use than a sick butterfly as soon as they were ready they went down the hill to the lake it was only a short distance then they came to the land belonging to the manor house was that a country house there were large neglected fields upon which the forest encroached more and more there was a bridge leading on to the island so shaky that they hardly thought it would keep together until they were safely over there was an avenue leading from the bridge to the main building covered with grass like a meadow and a tree which had been blown down and been left lying across the road the island was pretty enough so pretty that a castle might very well have been built there but nothing but weeds grew in the garden and in the large park the trees were choking each other and black snakes glided over the green wet walks anna stina felt uneasy when she saw how neglected everything was and went along mumbling to herself what does all this mean is stava dead how can she stand everything looking like this things were very different thirty years ago when i was last here what in the world can be the matter with stava she could not imagine that there could be such neglect in any place where stava lived ingrid walked behind her slowly and reluctantly the moment she put her foot on the bridge she felt that there were not two walking there but three someone had come to meet her there and had turned back to accompany her ingrid heard no footsteps but he who accompanied them appeared indistinctly by her side she could see there was some one she became terribly afraid she was just going to beg anna stina to turn back and tell her that everything seemed so strange here that she dare not go any further but before she had time to say anything the stranger came quite close to her and she recognized him before she only saw him indistinctly now she saw him so clearly that she could see it was the student it no longer seemed weird and ghost-like that he walked there it was only strangely delightful that he came to receive her it was as if it were he who had brought her there and would by coming to welcome her show that it was he walked with her over the bridge through the avenue quite up to the main building she could not help turning her head every moment to the left it was there she saw his face quite close to her cheek it was really not a face that she saw only an unspeakably beautiful smile that drew tenderly near her but if she turned her head quite round to see it properly it was no longer there no there was nothing one could see distinctly but as soon as she looked straight before her it was there again quite close to her her invisible companion did not speak to her he only smiled but that was enough for her it was more than enough to show her that there was one in the world who kept near her with tender love she felt his presence as something so real that she firmly believed he protected her and watched over her and before this happy consciousness vanished all the despair 
which her adopted mother's hard words had called for. Ingrid felt herself again given back to life. She had the right to live, as there was one who loved her. And this was why she entered the kitchen at Munkhyttan with a faint blush on her cheeks and with radiant eyes, fragile, weak, and transparent, but sweet as a newly opened rose. She still went about as if in a dream and did not know much about where she was, but what surprised her so much that it nearly awakened her was to see a new Anastina standing by the fireplace. She stood there, little and broad, with a large square face, exactly like the other. But why was she so fine, with a white cap with strings tied in a large bow under her chin, and with a black bombazine dress? Ingrid's head was so confused that it was some time before it occurred to her that this must be Miss Stava. She felt that Anna Stina looked uneasily at her, and she tried to pull herself together and say good day but the only thing her mind could grasp was the thought that he had come to her inside the kitchen there was a small room with blue checked covering on the furniture they were taken into that room and miss stava gave them coffee and something to eat anna stina at once began to talk about their errand she spoke for a long time, and said that she knew her sister stood so high in her ladyship's favour that she left it to her to engage the servants. Miss Stava said nothing, but she gave a look at Ingrid as much as to say that it would hardly have been left with her if she had chosen servants like her. Anna Stina praised Ingrid and said she was a good girl. She had hitherto served in a parsonage, but now that she was grown up, she wanted really to learn something, and that was why Anna Stina had brought her to one who could teach her more than any other person she knew. Miss Stava did not reply to this remark either, but her glance plainly showed that she was surprised that anyone who had had a situation in a parsonage had no clothes of her own but was obliged to borrow old Anna Stina's. Then old Anna Stina began to tell how she lived quite alone in the forest, deserted by all her relatives. And this young girl had come running up the hill many an evening and many an early morning to see her. She had therefore thought and hoped that she could now help her to get a good situation. Miss Stava said it was a pity that they had gone such a long way to find a place. If she were a clever girl, she could surely get a situation in some good family in their own neighborhood. Anna Stina could now clearly see that Ingrid's prospects were not good, and therefore she began in a more solemn vein. Here you have lived, Stava, and had a good, comfortable home all your life, and I have had to fight my way in great poverty. But I have never asked you for anything before today. And now you will send me away like a beggar to whom one gives a meal and nothing more. Miss Stava smiled a little. Then she said, Sister Anastina, you are not telling me the truth. I too come from Raglanda, and I should like to know at what peasant's house in that parish grow such eyes and such a face. And she pointed at Ingrid and continued, I can quite understand, Anastina, that you would like to help one who looks like that, but I do not understand how you can think that your sister Stava has not more sense than to believe the stories you choose to tell her. Anastina was so frightened that she could not say a word, but Ingrid made up her mind to confide in Miss Stava, and began at once to tell her whole story in her soft, beautiful voice and Ingrid had hardly told of how she had been lying in the grave, and that a dollar man had come and saved her, before old Miss Stava grew red and quickly bent down to hide it. It was only a second, but there must have been some cause for it, for from that moment she looked so kind. She soon began to ask full particulars about it. More especially, she wanted to know about the crazy man, whether Ingrid had not been afraid of him. Oh, no, 
he did no harm he was not mad ingrid said he could both buy and sell he was only frightened of some things ingrid thought the hardest of all was to tell what she had heard her adopted mother say but she told everything although there were tears in her voice then miss tava went up to her drew back the handkerchief from her head and looked into her eyes then she patted her lightly on the cheek never mind that little miss she said there is no need for me to know about that now sister and miss ingrid must excuse me she said soon after but i must take up her ladyship's coffee i shall soon be down again and you can tell me more when she returned she said she had told her ladyship about the young girl who had lain in the grave and now her mistress wanted to see her they were taken upstairs and shown into her ladyship's boudoir anna stina remained standing at the door of the fine room but ingrid was not shy she went straight up to the old lady and put out her hand she had often been shy with others who looked much less aristocratic but here in this house she did not feel embarrassed she only felt so wonderfully happy that she had come there so it is you my child who have been buried said her ladyship nodding friendly to her do you mind telling me your story my child i sit here quite alone and never hear anything you know then ingrid began again to tell her story but she had not got very far before she was interrupted her ladyship did exactly the same as miss stava had done she rose pushed the handkerchief back from ingrid's forehead and looked into her eyes yes her ladyship said to herself that i can understand i can understand that he must obey those eyes for the first time in her life ingrid was praised for her courage her ladyship thought she had been very brave to place herself in the hands of a crazy fellow she was afraid she said but she was still more afraid of people seeing her in that state and he did no harm he was almost quite right and then he was so good end of section four read by lars rolander section five of from a swedish homestead by selma lagerlöf this librivox recording is in the public domain reading by lars rolander section five the story of a country house part five her ladyship wanted to know his name but ingrid did not know it she had never heard of any other name but the goat her ladyship asked several times how he managed when he came to do business had she not laughed at him and did she not think that he looked terrible the goat it sounded so strange when her ladyship said the goat there was so much bitterness in her voice when she said it and yet she said it over and over again no ingrid did not think so and she never laughed at unfortunate people the old lady looked more gentle than her words sounded it appears you know how to manage mad people my child she said that is a great gift most people are afraid of such poor creatures she listened to all ingrid had to say and sat meditating as you have not any home my child she said will you not stay here with me you see i am an old woman living here by myself and you can keep me company and i shall take care that you have everything you want what do you say to it my child there will come a time i suppose continued her ladyship when we shall have to inform your parents that you are still living but for the present everything shall remain as it is so that you can have time to rest both body and mind and you shall call me aunt but what shall i call you ingrid ingrid berg ingrid 
said her ladyship thoughtfully. I would rather have called you something else. As soon as you entered the room with those star-like eyes, I thought you ought to be called Mignon. When it dawned upon the young girl that here she would really find a home, she felt more sure than ever that she had been brought here in some supernatural manner, and she whispered her thanks to her invisible protector before she thanked her ladyship, Miss Stava, and Anna Stina. Ingrid slept in a four-poster on luxurious feather beds three feet high, and had hem-stitched sheets and silken quilts embroidered with Swedish crowns and French lilies. The bed was so broad that she could lie as she liked either way, and so high that she must mount two steps to get into it. At the top sat the cupid holding the brightly coloured hangings, and on the posts sat other cupids which held them up in festoons. In the same room where the bed stood was an old curved chest of drawers inlaid with olive wood, and from it Ingrid might take as much sweetly scented linen as she liked. There was also a wardrobe containing many gay and pretty silken muslin gowns that only hung there and waited until it pleased her to put them on. When she awoke in the morning, there stood by her bedside a tray with a silver coffee set and old Indian china, and every morning she set her small white teeth in fine white bread and delicious almond cakes every day she was dressed in a fine muslin gown with a lace fichu her hair was dressed high at the back but round her forehead there was a row of little light curls on the wall between the windows hung a mirror with a narrow glass in a broad frame where she could see herself and nod her picture and ask is it you is it really you how have you come here in the daytime when ingrid had left the chamber with the four-poster she sat in the drawing-room and embroidered or painted on silk and when she was tired of that she played a little on the guitar and sang or talked with the old lady who taught her french and amused herself by training her to be a fine lady but she had come to an enchanted castle she could not get away from that idea she had had that feeling the first moment and it was always coming back again no one arrived at the house no one left it in this big house only two or three rooms were kept in order in the others no one ever went no one walked in the garden no one looked after it there was only one man-servant and an old man who cut the firewood and miss stava had only two servants who helped her in the kitchen and in the dairy but there was always dainty food on the table and her ladyship and ingrid were always waited upon and dressed like fine ladies of rank if nothing thrived on the old estate there was at any rate fertile soil for dreams and even if they did not nurse and cultivate flowers there ingrid was not the one to neglect her dream roses they grew up around her whenever she was alone it seemed to her then as if red dream roses formed a canopy over her round the island where the trees bent low over the water and sent long branches in between the reeds and where shrubs and lofty trees grew luxuriantly was a pathway where ingrid often walked it looked so strange to see so many letters carved on the trees to see the old seats and summer-houses to see the old tumble-down pavilions which were so worn-eaten that she dared not go into them to think that real people had walked here that here they had lived and longed and loved and that this had not always been an enchanted castle down here she felt even more the witchery of the place here the face with a smile came to her here she could thank him the student because he had brought her to a home where she was so happy where they loved her and made her forget how hardly others had treated her 
if it had not been he who had arranged all this for her she could not possibly have been allowed to remain here it was quite impossible she knew that it must be he she had never before had such wild fancies she had always been thinking of him but she had never felt that he was so near her that he took care of her the only thing she longed for was that he himself should come for of course he would come some day it was impossible that he should not come in these avenues he had left behind part of his soul summer went and autumn christmas was drawing near miss ingrid said the old housekeeper one day in a rather mysterious manner i think i ought to tell you that the young master who owns monkeyton is coming home for christmas in any case he generally comes she added with a sigh and her ladyship who has never even mentioned that he has a son said ingrid but she was not really surprised she might just as well have answered that she had known it all along no one has spoken to you about him miss ingrid said the housekeeper for her ladyship has forbidden us to speak about him and then miss stava would not say any more neither did ingrid want to ask any more now she was afraid of hearing something definite she had raised her expectations so high that she was herself afraid they would fail the truth might be well worth hearing but it might also be bitter and destroy all her beautiful dreams but from that day he was with her night and day she had hardly time to speak to others she must always be with him one day she saw that they had cleared the snow away from the avenue she grew almost frightened was he coming now the next day her ladyship sat from early morning in the window looking down the avenue ingrid had gone further into the room she was so restless that she could not remain at the window do you know who i am expecting to-day ingrid the young girl nodded she dared not depend upon her voice to answer has miss stava told you that my son is peculiar ingrid shook her head he is very peculiar he i cannot speak about it i cannot you must see for yourself it sounded heartrending ingrid grew very uneasy what was there with this house that made everything so strange was it something terrible that she did not know about was her ladyship not on good terms with her son what was it what was it the one moment in an ecstasy of joy the next in a fever of uncertainty she was obliged to call forth the long row of visions in order again to feel that it must be he who came she could not at all say why she so firmly believed that he must be the son just of this house he might for the matter of that be quite another person oh how hard it was that she had never heard his name it was a long day they sat waiting in silence until evening came the man came driving a cartload of christmas logs and the horse remained in the yard whilst the wood was unloaded ingrid said her ladyship in a commanding and hasty tone run down to anders and tell him that he must be quick and get the horse into the stable quick quick ingrid ran down the stairs and on to the veranda but when she came out she forgot to call to the man just behind the cart she saw a tall man in a sheepskin coat and with a large pack on his back it was not necessary for her to see him standing curtsying and curtsying to recognize him but but she put her hand to her head and drew a deep breath how would all these things ever become clear to her was it for that fellow's sake her ladyship had sent her down and the man why did he pull the horse away in such great haste and why did he take off his cap and salute 
What had that crazy man to do with the people of this house? All at once the truth flashed upon Ingrid so crushingly and overwhelmingly that she could have screamed. It was not her beloved who had watched over her. It was this crazy man. She had been allowed to remain here because she had spoken kindly of him, because his mother wanted to carry on the good work which he had commenced. The goat, that, was the young master. But to her no one came. No one had brought her here. No one had expected her. It was all dreams, fancies, illusions. Oh, how hard it was, if she had only never expected him. But at night, when Ingrid lay in the big bed with the brightly colored hangings, she dreamt over and over again that she saw the student come home. It was not you who came, she said. Yes, of course it was I, he replied. And in her dreams she believed him. One day, the week after Christmas, Ingrid sat at the window in the boudoir embroidering. Her ladyship sat on the sofa knitting, as she always did now. There was silence in the room. Young Hede had been home for a week. During all that time, Ingrid had never seen him. In his home, too, he lived like a peasant, slept in the men's servants' quarters, and had his meals in the kitchen. He never went to see his mother. Ingrid knew that both her ladyship and Miss Stave expected that she should do something for Hede, that at the least she would try to persuade him to remain at home and it grieved her that it was impossible for her to do what they wished. She was in despair about herself and about the utter weakness that had come over her since her expectations had been so shattered. Today Miss Stava had just come in to say that Hede was getting his pack ready to start. He was not even staying as long as he generally did at Christmas, she said with a reproachful look at Ingrid ingrid understood all they had expected from her but she could do nothing she sued and sued without saying anything miss stava went away and there was again silence in the room ingrid quite forgot that she was not alone a feeling of drowsiness suddenly came over her whilst all her sad thoughts wove themselves into a strange fancy she thought she was walking up and down the whole of the large house. She went through a number of rooms and saloons. She saw them before her with grey covers over the furniture. The paintings and the chandeliers were covered with gauze, and on the floors was a layer of thick dust, which whirled about when she went through the rooms. But at last she came to a room where she had never been before. It was quite a small chamber where both walls and Celine were black. But when she came to look more closely at them, she saw that the chamber was neither painted black nor covered with black material. But it was so dark on account of the walls and the ceiling being completely covered with bats. The whole room was nothing but a huge nest for bats. In one of the windows a pane was broken so one could understand how the bats had got in in such incredible numbers that they covered the whole room they hung there in their undisturbed winter sleep not one moved when she entered but she was seized by such terror at this sight that she began to shiver and shake all over it was dreadful to see the quantity of bats she so distinctly saw hanging there they all had black wings wrapped around them like cloaks they all hung from the walls by a single long claw in undisturbable sleep she saw it all so distinctly that she wondered if miss stava knew that the bats had taken possession of a whole room in her thoughts she then went to miss stava and asked her whether she had been into that room and seen all the bats of course i have seen them said miss stava 
It is their own room. I suppose you know, Miss Ingrid, that there is not a single old country house in all Sweden where they have not to give up a room to the bats. I have never heard that before, Ingrid said. When you have lived as long in the world as I have, Miss Ingrid, you will find out that I am speaking the truth, said Miss Stava. I cannot understand that people will put up with such a thing, Ingrid said. We are obliged to, said Miss Stava. Those bats are Mistress Sorrow's birds, and she has commanded us to receive them. End of section 5. Read by Lars Rolander. Section 6 of From a Swedish Homestead by Selma Lagerlöf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Lars Rolander. Section 6. The Story of a Country House. Part 6. Ingrid saw that Miss Stava did not wish to say anything more about that matter, and she began to sue again. But she could not help speculating over who that Mistress Sorrow could be who had so much power here that she could compel Miss Stava to give up a whole room to the bats. Just as she was thinking about all this, she saw a black sledge drawn by a black horse pull up outside the veranda. She saw Miss Stava come out and make a low curtsy. An old lady in a long black velvet cloak with many small capes on the shoulders alighted from the sledge. She was bent and had difficulty in walking. She could hardly lift her feet sufficiently to walk up the steps. Ingrid, said her ladyship, looking up from her knitting, I think I heard Mistress Sorrow arrive. It must have been her jingle I heard. Have you noticed that she never has sledge-bells on her horses, but only quite a small jingle? But one can hear it. One can hear it. Go down into the hall, Ingrid, and bid Mistress Sorrow welcome. When Ingrid came down into the front hall, Mistress Sorrow stood talking with Miss Stava on the veranda. They did not notice her. Ingrid saw with surprise that the round-backed old lady had something hidden under all her capes which looked like crape it was put well up and carefully hidden ingrid had to look very closely before she discovered that they were two large bats wings which she tried to hide the young girl grew still more curious and tried to see her face but she stood and looked into the yard so it was impossible so much however ingrid did see when she put out her hand to the housekeeper that one of her fingers was much longer than the others, and at the end of it was a large crooked claw. I suppose everything is as usual here, she said. Yes, honored Mistress Sorrow, said Miss Stava. You have not planted any flowers nor pruned my trees. You have not mended the bridge nor weeded the avenue no honoured mistress this is quite as it should be said the honoured mistress i suppose you have not had the audacity to search for the vein of ore or to cut down the forest which is encroaching on the fields no honoured mistress or to clean the wells no nor to clean the wells this is a nice place said mistress sorrow i always like being here in a few years things will be in such a state that my birds can live over the house you are really very good to my birds miss stava at this praise the housekeeper made a deep curtsy how are things otherwise at the house said mistress sorrow what sort of a christmas have you had we have kept christmas as we always do said miss stava her ladyship sits knitting in her room day after day thinks of nothing but her son and does not even know that it is a festival christmas eve we allow to pass like any other day no present 
and no candles no christmas tree no christmas fair nor any going to church not so much as a candle in the windows on christmas morning why should her ladyship honour god's son when god will not heal her son said mistress sorrow no why should she he is at home at present i suppose perhaps he is better now no he is no better he is as much afraid of things as ever does he still behave like a peasant does he never go into the rooms we cannot get him to go into the rooms he is afraid of her ladyship as the honoured mistress knows he has his meals in the kitchen and sleeps in the men's servants room yes he does and you have no idea how to cure him we know nothing we understand nothing mr sorrow was silent for a moment when she spoke again there was a hard sharp ring in her voice this is all right as far as it goes miss Dava, but i'm not quite satisfied with you all the same the same moment she turned round and looked sharply at ingrid ingrid shuddered mistress sorrow had a little wrinkled face the under part of which was so doubled up that one could hardly see the lower jaw she had teeth like a saw and thick hair on the upper lip her eyebrows were one single tuft of hair and her skin was quite brown ingrid thought miss dava could not see what she saw mistress sorrow was not a human being she was only an animal mistress sorrow opened her mouth and showed her glittering teeth when she looked at ingrid when this girl came here she said to miss dava you thought she had been sent by god you thought you could see from her eyes that she had been sent by our lord to save him she knew how to manage mad people well how has it worked it has not worked at all she has not done anything no i have seen to that said mistress sorrow it was my doing that you did not tell her why she was allowed to stay here had she known that she would not have indulged in such rosy dreams about seeing her beloved if she had not had such expectations she would not have had such a bitter disappointment her disappointment not paralyzed her she could perhaps have done something for this mad fellow but now she has not even been to see him she hates him because he is not the one she expected him to be that is my doing miss dava my doing yes the honoured mistress knows her business said miss dava mistress sorrow took her lace handkerchief and dried her red-rimmed eyes it looked as if it were meant for an expression of joy you need not make yourself out to be any better than you are miss dava she said i know you do not like my having taken that room for my birds you do not like the thought of my having the whole house soon i know that you and your mistress had intended to cheat me but it is all over now yes said miss dava the honoured mistress can be quite easy it's all over the young master is leaving to-day he has packed up his pack and then we always know he's about to leave everything her ladyship and i have been dreaming about the whole autumn is over nothing has been done we thought she might at least have persuaded him to remain at home but in spite of all we have done for her she has not done anything for us no she has only been a poor help i know that said mistress sorrow but all the same she must be sent away now that was really what i wanted to see her ladyship about mistress sorrow began to drag herself up the steps on her tottering legs 
At every step she raised her wings a little, as if they should help her. She would no doubt much rather have flown. Ingrid went behind her. She felt strangely attracted and fascinated. If Mistress Sorrow had been the most beautiful woman in the world, she could not have felt a greater inclination to follow her. When she went into the boudoir, she saw Mistress Sorrow sitting on the sofa by the side of her ladyship, whispering confidentially with her as if they were old friends. You must be able to see that you cannot keep her with you, said Mistress Sorrow impressively. You who cannot bear to see a flower growing in your garden can surely not stand having a young girl about in the house. It always brings a certain amount of brightness and life, and that would not suit you. No, that is just what I have been sitting and thinking about get her a situation as lady's companion somewhere or other but don't keep her here she rose to say good-bye that was all i wanted to see you about she said but how are you yourself knives and scissors cut my heart all day long said her ladyship i only live in him as long as he is at home it is worse than usual much worse this time i cannot bear it much longer ingrid started it was her ladyship's bell that rang she had been dreaming so vividly that she was quite surprised to see that her ladyship was alone and that the black sledge was not waiting before the door her ladyship had rung for miss Tava, but she did not come she asked ingrid to go down to her room and call her ingrid went but the little blue checked room was empty the young girl was going into the kitchen to ask for the housekeeper but before she had time to open the door she heard hede talking she stopped outside she could not persuade herself to go in and see him she tried however to argue with herself it was not his fault that he was not the one she had been expecting she must try to do something for him she must persuade him to remain at home before she had not had such a feeling against him he was not so very bad she bent down and peeped through the keyhole it was the same here as at other places the servants tried to lead him on in order to amuse themselves by his strange talk they asked him whom he was going to marry hede smiled he liked to be asked about that kind of thing she's called grave lily don't you know that he said the servant said she did not know that she had such a fine name but where does she live neither has she home nor has she farm hede said she lives in my pack the servant said that was a queer home and asked about her parents neither has she father nor has she mother hede said she is as fine as a flower she has grown up in a garden he said all this with a certain amount of clearness but when he wanted to describe how beautiful his sweetheart was he could not get on at all he said a number of words but they were strangely mixed together one could not follow his thoughts but evidently he himself derived much pleasure from what he said he sat smiling and happy Ingrid hurried away. She could not bear it any longer. She could not do anything for him. She was afraid of him. She disliked him. But she had not got further than the stairs before her conscience pricked her. Here she had received so much kindness, and she would not make any return. In order to master her dislike, she tried in her own mind to think of Hede as a gentleman. She wondered how he had looked when he wore good clothes and had his hair brushed back she closed her eyes for a moment and thought no it was impossible she could not imagine him as being any different from what he was the same moment she saw the outlines of a beloved face by her side it appeared at her left side wonderfully distinct 
This time the face did not smile. The lips trembled as if in pain, and unspeakable suffering was written in sharp lines round the mouth. Ingrid stopped halfway up the stairs and looked at it. There it was, light and fleeting, as impossible to grasp and hold fast as a sunspot reflected by the prism of a chandelier, but just as visible, just as real. She thought of a recent dream, but this was different. This was reality. When she had looked a little at the face, the lips began to move. They spoke, but she could not hear a sound. Then she tried to see what they said, tried to read the words from the lips, as deaf people do, and she succeeded. Do not let me go, the lips said. Do not let me go. And the anguish with which it was said, if a fellow creature had been lying at her feet begging for life, it could not have affected her more. She was so overcome that she shook. It was more heart-rending than anything she had ever heard in her whole life. Never had she thought that anyone could beg in such fearful anguish. Again and again the lips begged, Do not let me go! And for every time the anguish was greater. Ingrid did not understand it but remained standing filled with unspeakable pity. It seemed to her that more than life itself must be at stake for one who begged like this, that his very soul must be at stake. The lips did not move any more. They stood half open in dull despair. When they assumed this expression, she uttered a cry and stumbled. She recognized the face of the crazy fellow as she had just seen it no 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 she said it cannot be so it must not it cannot it is not possible that it is he the same moment the face vanished she must have sat for a whole hour on the cold staircase crying in helpless despair but at last hope sprang up in her strong and fair she again took courage to raise her head all that had happened seemed to show that she should save him it was for that she had come here she should have the great great happiness of saving him end of section six read by lars rolander Section seven of From a Swedish Homestead by Selma Lagerlöf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Lars Rolander. Section seven. The Story of a Country House. Part seven. In the little boudoir, her ladyship was talking to Miss Dava. It sounded so pitiful to hear her asking the housekeeper to persuade her son to remain a few days longer. Miss Dava tried to appear hard and severe. Of course I can ask him, she said, but your ladyship knows that no one can make him stay longer than he wants. We have money enough, you know. There is not the slightest necessity for him to go. Can you not tell him that? said your ladyship. At the same moment Ingrid came in. The door opened noiselessly. She glided through the room with light, airy steps. Her eyes were radiant as if she had beheld something beautiful afar off. When her ladyship saw her, she frowned a little. She also felt an inclination to be cruel, to give pain. Ingrid, she said, come here. I must speak with you about your future. The young girl had fetched her guitar and was about to leave the room. She turned round to her ladyship. My future, she said, putting her hand to her forehead. My future is already decided, you know, she continued with the smile of a martyr, and without saying any more, she left the room. Her ladyship and Stava looked in surprise at each other. They began to discuss where they should send the young girl. But when Miss Stava came down to her room, she found Ingrid sitting there singing some little songs and playing the guitar and Hede sat opposite her, listening, his face all sunshine. 
Ever since Ingrid had recognized the student in the poor, crazy fellow, she had no other thought but that of trying to cure him. But this was a difficult task, and she had no idea whatever as to how she should set about it. To begin with, she only thought of how she could persuade him to remain at Munkhyttan, and this was easy enough. Only for the sake of hearing her play the violin or the guitar a little every day, he would now sit patiently from morning till evening in Miss Stava's room waiting for her. She thought it would be a great thing if she could get him to go into the other rooms, but that she could not. She tried keeping in her room and said she would not play any more for him if he did not come to her. But after she had remained there two days, he began to pack up his pack to go away, and then she was obliged to give in. He showed great preference for her, and distinctly showed that he liked her better than others, but she did not make him less frightened. She begged him to leave off his sheepskin coat and wear an ordinary coat. He consented at once, but the next day he had it on again. Then she hid it from him but he then appeared in the man-servant's skin coat, so then they would rather let him keep his own. He was still as frightened as ever, and took great care no one came too near him. Even Ingrid was not allowed to sit quite close to him. One day she said to him that now he must promise her something. He must give over curtsying to the cat. She would not ask him to do anything so difficult as give up curtsying to horses and dogs but surely he could not be afraid of a little cat yes he said the cat was a goat it can't be a goat she said it has no horns you know he was pleased to hear that it seemed as if at last he had found something by which he could distinguish a goat from other animals the next day he met miss stava's cat that goat has no horns he said and laughed quite proudly. He went past it and sat down on the sofa to listen to Ingrid playing. But after he had sat a little while, he grew restless, and he rose, went up to the cat, and curtsied. Ingrid was in despair. She took him by his arm and shook him. He ran straight out from the room and did not appear until the next day. Child, child, said her ladyship, you do exactly as I did. You try the same as I did. It will end by your frightening him so that he dare not see you any more. It is better to leave him in peace. We are satisfied with things as they are if he will only remain at home. There was nothing else for Ingrid to do but wring her hands in sorrow that such a fine, lovable fellow should be concealed in this crazy man. Ingrid thought again and again. Had she really only come here to play her grandfather's tunes to him? Should they go on like that all through life? Would it never be otherwise? She also told him many stories, and in the midst of a story his face would lighten up, and he would say something wonderfully subtle and beautiful. A sane person would never have thought of anything like it, and no more was needed to make her courage rise and then she began again with these endless experiments. It was late one afternoon, and the moon was just about to rise. White snow lay on the ground, and bright gray ice covered the lake. The trees were blackish-brown, and the sky was a flaming red after the sunset. Ingrid was on her way to the lake to skate. She went along a narrow path where the snow was quite trodden down. Gunnar Hede went behind her. There was something cowed in his bearing that made one think of a dog following its master. Ingrid looked tired. There was no brightness in her eyes, and her complexion was grey. As she walked along, she wondered whether the day, which was now so nearly over, was content with itself. If it were from joy, it had lighted the great flaming red sunset far away in the west. She knew she could light no bonfire over this day, nor over any other day. In the whole month that had passed since she recognized Gunnar Hede, she had gained nothing. And today a great fear had come upon her. It seemed to her as if she might perhaps 
lose her love over all this. She was nearly forgetting the student only for thinking of the poor fellow. All that was bright and beautiful and youthful vanished from her love. Nothing was left but dull, heavy, earnest. She was quite in despair as she walked towards the lake. She felt she did not know what ought to be done, felt that she must give it all up. Oh, God, to have him walking behind her, apparently strong and whole, and yet so helplessly incurable sick. They had reached the lake, and she was putting on her skates. She also wanted him to skate, and helped him to put on his skates. But he fell as soon as he got on to the ice. He scrambled to the bank and sat down on a stone, and she skated away from him. Just opposite the stone upon which Gunnar Hede was sitting was an islet overgrown with birches and poplars, and behind it the radiant evening sky, which was still flaming red, and the fine light leafless tops of the trees stood against the glorious sky with such beauty that it was impossible not to notice it. Is it not a fact that one always recognizes a place by a single feature? One does not exactly know how even the most familiar spot looks from all sides, and Munkhyttan one always knew by the little islet. If one had not seen the place for many years, one would know it again by this islet, where the dark treetops were lifted towards the sunset. Hede sat quite still and looked at the islet and at the branches of the trees and at the grey eyes which surrounded it. This was the view he knew best of all. There was nothing on the whole estate he knew so well, for it was always this islet that attracted the eye. And soon he was sitting looking at the islet without thinking about it, just as one does with things one knows so well. He sat for a long time gazing. Nothing disturbed him, not a human being, not a gust of wind, no strange object. He could not see Ingrid. She had skated far away on the ice. A rest and peace fell upon Gunnar Hede, such as one only feels in home surroundings. Security and peace came to him from the little islet. It quieted the everlasting unrest that tormented him. Hede always imagined he was amongst enemies, and always thought of defending himself. For many years he had not felt that peace which made it possible for him to forget himself. But now it came upon him. Whilst Gunnar Hede was sitting thus and not thinking of anything, he happened mechanically to make a movement as one may do when one finds oneself in accustomed circumstances. As he sat there with the shining eyes before him, and with skates on his feet, he got up and skated on to the lake, and he thought as little of what he was doing as one thinks of how one is holding a fork or spoon when eating. He glided over the ice. It was glorious skating. He was a long way off the shore before he realized what he was doing. Splendid ice, he thought. I wonder why I did not come down earlier in the day. It is a good thing I was more here yesterday, he said. I will really not waste a single day during the rest of my vacation. No doubt it was because Gunnar Hede happened to do something he was in the habit of doing before he was ill that his old self awakened within him. Thoughts and associations connected with his former life began to force themselves upon his consciousness and at the same time all the thoughts connected with his illness sank into oblivion. It had been his habit when skating to take a wide turn on the lake in order to see beyond a certain point. He did so now without thinking, but when he had turned the point, he knew he had skated there to see if there was a light in his mother's window. She thinks it is time I was coming home, but she must wait a little. The ice is too good. But it was mostly vague sensations of pleasure over the exercise and the beautiful evening that were awakened within him. A moonlight evening like this was just the time for skating. He was so fond of this peaceful transition from day to night. It was still light, 
but the stillness of night was already there, the best both of day and of night. There was another skater on the ice. It was a young girl. He was not sure if he knew her, but he skated towards her to find out. No, it was no one he knew, but he could not help making a remark when he passed her about the splendid eyes. The stranger was probably a young girl from the town. She was evidently not accustomed to be addressed in this unceremonious manner. She looked quite frightened when he spoke to her. He certainly was queerly dressed. He was dressed quite like a peasant. Well, he did not want to frighten her away. He turned off and skated further up the lake. The ice was big enough for them both. But Ingrid had nearly screamed with astonishment. He had come towards her, skating elegantly, with his arms crossed, the brim of his hat turned up, and his hair thrown back so that it did not fall over his ears. He had spoken with the voice of a gentleman, almost without the slightest dollar accent. She did not stop to think about it. She skated quickly towards the shore. She came breathless into the kitchen. She did not know how to say it shortly and quickly enough. Miss Dava, the young master has come home. The kitchen was empty. Neither the housekeeper nor the servants were there. Nor was there anybody in the housekeeper's room. Ingrid rushed through the whole house, went into rooms where no one ever went. The whole time she cried out, Miss Dava, Miss Dava, the young master has come home. She was quite beside herself and went on calling out, even when she stood on the landing upstairs surrounded by the servants, Miss Dava and her ladyship herself. She said it over and over again. She was too much excited to stop. They all understood what she meant. They stood there quite as much overcome as she was. Ingrid turned restlessly from the one to the other. She ought to give explanations and orders, but about what? That she could so lose her presence of mind. She looked wildly questioning at her ladyship. What was it I wanted? The old lady gave some orders in a low, trembling voice. She almost whispered, Light the candles and make a fire in the young master's room. Lay out the young master's clothes. It was neither the place nor the time for Miss Dava to be important, but there was all the same a certain superior ring in her voice as she answered. There is always a fire in the young master's room. The young master's clothes are always in readiness for him. Ingrid had better go up to her room, said her ladyship. The young girl did just the opposite. She went into the drawing-room, placed herself at the window, sobbed and shook, but did not herself know that she was not still. She impatiently dried the tears from her eyes, so that she could see over the snow-field in front of the house. If only she did not cry, there was nothing she could miss seeing in the clear moonlight. At last he came. There he is, there he is, she cried to her ladyship. He walks quickly, he runs. Do come and see. Her ladyship sat quite still before the fire. She did not move. She strained her ears to hear just as much as the other strained her eyes to see. She asked Ingrid to be quiet so that she could hear how he walked. Ah, yes, she would be quiet. Her ladyship should hear how he walked. She grasped the window sill as if that could help her. You shall be quiet, she whispered, so that her ladyship can hear how he walks. Her ladyship sat bending forward, listening with all her soul. Did she already hear his steps in the courtyard? She probably thought he would go towards the kitchen. Did she hear that it was the front steps that creaked? Did she hear that it was the door to the front hall that opened? Did she hear how quickly he came up the stairs, two or three steps at a time? Had his mother heard that? It was not the dragging step of a peasant, as it had been when he left the house. It was almost more than they could bear to hear him coming towards the door of the drawing-room. Had he come in then, they would no doubt both have screamed. 
but he turned down the corridor to his own rooms. Her ladyship fell back in her chair, and her eyes closed. Ingrid thought her ladyship would have liked to die at that moment. Without opening her eyes, she put out her hand. Ingrid went softly up and took it. The old lady drew her towards her. Mignon, Mignon, she said. That was the right name after all. But, she continued, we must not cry. We must not speak about it. Take a stool and come and sit down by the fire. We must be calm, my little friend. Let us speak about something else. We must be perfectly calm when he comes in. Half an hour afterwards, Hede came in. The tea was on the table, and the chandelier was lighted. He had dressed. Every trace of the peasant had disappeared. Ingrid and her ladyship pressed each other's hands. They had been sitting trying to imagine how he would look when he came in. It was impossible to say what he might say or do, said her ladyship. One never had known what he might do. But in any case, they would be quite calm. A feeling of great happiness had come over her, and that had quieted her. She was resting free from all sorrow in the arms of angels carrying her upwards, upwards. But when Hede came in, there was no sign of confusion about him. I have only come to tell you, he said, that I have got such a headache that I shall have to go to bed at once. I felt it already when I was on the ice. Her ladyship made no reply. Everything was so simple. She had never thought it would be like that. It took her a few moments to realize that he did not know anything about his illness, that he was living somewhere in the past. But perhaps I can first drink a cup of tea, he said, looking a little surprised at their silence. Her ladyship went to the tea tray. He looked at her. Have you been crying, mother? You are so quiet. Oh, we have been sitting talking about a sad story, I and my young friend here, said her ladyship, pointing to Ingrid. I beg your pardon, he said. I did not see you had visitors. The young girl came forward towards the light, beautiful as one would be who knew that the gates of heaven the next moment would open before her. He bowed a little stiffly. He evidently did not know who she was. Her ladyship introduced them to each other. He looked curiously at Ingrid. I think I saw Miss Perry on the ice, he said. He knew nothing about her, had never spoken to her before. End of section 7 Read by Lars Rolander Section 8 of From a Swedish Homestead by Selma Lagerlöf This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Lars Rolander Section 8 the story of a country house part eight a short happy time followed gunnar hede was certainly not quite himself but those around him were happy in the belief that he soon would be his memory was partly gone he knew nothing about certain periods of his life he could not play the violin he had almost forgotten all he knew and his power of thinking was weak and he preferred neither to read nor to write but still he was very much better he was not frightened he was fond of his mother he had again assumed the manners and habits of a gentleman one can easily understand that her ladyship and all her household were delighted hede was in the best of spirits bright and joyous all day long he never speculated over anything put to one side everything he could not understand never spoke about anything that necessitated mental exertion but talked merrily and cheerfully he was most happy when he was engaged in bodily exercise he took ingrid out with him sledging and skating he did not talk much to her but she was happy to be with him he was kind to ingrid as he was to everyone else but not in the least in love with her he often wondered about his fiancee wondered why she never wrote 
but after a short time that trouble too left him. He always put away from him anything that worried him. Ingrid thought that he would never get really well by doing like this. He must sometime be made to think, to face his own thoughts, which he was afraid of doing now. But she dared not compel him to do this, and there was no one else who dared. If he began to care for her a little, perhaps she might dare. She thought all they now wanted, every one of them, was a little happiness. It was just at that time that a little child died in the parsonage at Draglanda, where Ingrid had been brought up, and the grave digger was about to dig the grave. The man dug the grave quite close to the spot where the previous summer he had dug the grave for Ingrid, and when he had got a few feet into the ground, he happened to lay bare a corner of her coffin. The grave digger could not help smiling a little to himself, of course he had heard that the dead girl lying in this coffin had appeared she was supposed to have unscrewed her coffin lid on the very day of her funeral risen from the grave and appeared at the parsonage the pastor's wife was not so much liked but that people in the parish rather enjoyed telling this story about her the grave digger thought that people should only know how securely the dead were lying in the ground and how fast the coffin lids he interrupted himself in the midst of his thought on the corner of the coffin which was exposed the lid was not quite straight and one of the screws was not quite fast he did not say anything he did not think anything but stopped digging and whistled the whole reveille of the vermland regiment for he was an old soldier then he thought he had better examine the thing properly it would never do for a grave digger to have thoughts about the dead which might come and trouble him during the dark autumn nights he hastily removed some more earth then he began to hammer on the coffin with his shovel the coffin answered quite distinctly that it was empty empty half an hour after the grave digger was at the parsonage there was no end to the questioning and surmises so much they were all agreed upon that the young girl had been in the dollar man's pack but what had become of her afterwards anna stina stood at the oven in the parsonage and looked after the baking for the course there was baking to be done for the new funeral she stood for a long time listening to all this talk without saying a word all she took care of was that the cakes were not burnt she put sheet tins in and took sheet tins out and it was dangerous to approach her as she stood there with a long baker's shovel but suddenly she took off her kitchen apron wiped the worst of the sweet and the soot from her face and was talking with the pastor in his study almost before she knew how it had come about after this it was not so very wonderful that one day in march the pastor's little red painted sledge ornamented with green tulips and drawn by the pastor's little red horse pulled up at munkhyttan ingrid was of course obliged to go back with the pastor home to her mother the pastor had come to fetch her he did not say much about their being glad that she was alive but one could see how happy he was he had never been able to forgive himself that they had not been more kind to their adopted daughter and now he was radiant at the thought that he was allowed to make a new beginning and make everything good for her this time they did not speak a word about the reason why she had run away it was of no use bringing that up again so long after but ingrid understood that the pastor's wife had had a hard time and had suffered many pangs of conscience and that they wanted to have her back again in order to be good to her she felt that she was almost obliged to go back to the parsonage to show that she had no ill feeling against her adopted parents they all thought it was the most natural thing that she should go to the parsonage for a week or two and why should she not 
She could not make the excuse that they needed her at Munkhyttan. She could surely be away for some weeks without it doing Gunnar Hede any harm. She felt it was hard, but it was best she should go away, as they all thought it was the right thing. Perhaps she had hoped they would ask her not to go away. She took her seat in the sledge with the feeling that her ladyship or Miss Dava would surely come and lift her out of it and carry her into the house again. It was impossible to realize that she was actually driving down the avenue, that she was turning into the forest, and that Munkhyttan was disappearing behind her. But supposing it was from pure goodness that they let her go? They thought perhaps that youth, with its craving for pleasure, wanted to get away from the loneliness of Munkhyttan. They thought perhaps she was tired of being the keeper of a crazy man. She raised her hand and was on the point of seizing the reins and turning the horse. Now that she was several miles from the house, it struck her that that was why they had let her go. She would have liked so much to have gone back and asked them. In her utter loneliness, she felt as if she were groping about in the wild forest. There was not a single human being who answered her or advised her. She received just as much answer from fir and pine and squirrel and owl as she did from any human being. It was really a matter of utter indifference to her how they treated her at the parsonage. They were very kind to her as far as she knew, but it really did not matter. If she had come to a palace full of everything one could most desire, that would likewise have been the same to her. No bed is soft enough to give rest unto one whose heart is full of longing. In the beginning she had asked them every day, as modestly as she could, if they would not let her go home, now that she had had the great happiness of seeing her mother and her brothers and sisters. But roads were really too bad. She must stay with them until the frost had disappeared. It was not a matter of life and death, they supposed, to go back to that place. Ingrid could not understand why it annoyed people when she said she wanted to go back to Munkhyttan, but this seemed to be the case with her father and her mother and everybody else in the parish. One had no right, it appeared, to long for any other place in the world when one was at Raglanda. She soon saw it was best not to speak about her going away. There were so many difficulties in the way whenever she spoke about it. It was not enough that the roads were still in the same bad condition. They surrounded her with walls and ramparts and moats. She would knit and weave and plant out in the forcing frames and surely she would not go away until after the large birthday party at the dean's and she could not think of leaving till after karin landberg's wedding there was nothing for her to do but to lift her hands in supplication to the spring and beg it to make haste with its work beg for sunshine and warmth beg the gentle sun to do its very best for the great border forest send small piercing rays between the fir trees and melt the snow beneath them dear dear son it did not matter if the snow were not melted in the valley if only the snow would vanish from the mountains if only the forest paths became passable if only the setter girls were able to go to their huts if only the bogs became dry if only it became possible to go by the forest road which was half the distance of the high road ingrid knew one who would not wait for carriage or ask for money to drive if only the road through the forest became passable she knew one who would leave the parsonage some moonlit night and who would do it without asking a single person's permission she thought she had waited for the spring before that everybody does but now Ingrid knew that she had never before longed for it. Oh, no, no, she had never before known 
what it was to long before she had waited for green leaves and anemones and the song of the thrush and the cuckoo but that was childishness nothing more they did not long for the spring who only thought of what was beautiful one should take the first bit of earth that peeped through the snow and kiss it one should pluck the first coarse leaf of the nettle simply to burn into one that now the spring had come everybody was very good to her but although they did not say anything they seemed to think that she was always thinking of leaving them i can't understand why you want to go back to that place and look after that crazy fellow said karin landberg one day it seemed as if she could read ingrid's thoughts oh she has given up thinking of that now said the pastor's wife before the young girl had time to answer when karin was gone the pastor's wife said people wonder that you want to leave us ingrid was silent they say that when hede began to improve perhaps you fell in love with him oh no not after he had begun to improve ingrid said feeling almost inclined to laugh in any case he's not the sort of person one could marry said her adopted mother father and i have been speaking about it and we think it is best that you should remain with us it is very good of you that you want to keep me ingrid said and she was touched that now they wanted to be so kind to her they did not believe her however obedient she was she could not understand what little bird it was that told them about her longing now her adopted mother had told her that she must not go back to munkhyttan but even then she could not leave the matter alone if they really wanted you she said they would write for you ingrid again felt inclined to laugh that would be the strangest thing of all should there be a letter from the enchanted castle she would like to know if her adopted mother thought that the king of the mountain wrote for the maiden who had been swallowed by the mountain to come back when she had gone to see her mother but if her adopted mother had known how many messages she had received she would probably have been even more uneasy there came messages to her in her dreams by nights and there came messages to her in her visions by day he let ingrid know that he was in need of her he was so ill so ill she knew that he was nearly going out of his mind again and that she must go to him if anyone had told her this she would simply have answered that she knew it the large star-like eyes joked further and further away those who saw that look would never believe that she meant to stay quietly and patiently at home it is not very difficult either to see whether a person is content or full of longing one only needs to see a little gleam of happiness in the eyes when he or she comes in from work and sits down by the fire but in ingrid's eyes there was no gleam of happiness except when she saw the mountain stream come down through the forest broad and strong it was that that should repair the way for her it happened one day that ingrid was sitting alone with karin landberg and she began to tell her about her life at munkhyttan karin was quite shocked how could ingrid stand such a life karin landberg was to be married very soon and she was now at that stage when she could speak of nothing but her lover she knew nothing but what he had taught her and she could do nothing without first consulting him it occurred to her that olof had said something about gunnar hede which would help to frighten ingrid if she had begun to like that crazy fellow and then she began to tell her how mad he had really been for olof had told her that when he was at the fair last autumn some gentlemen had said that they did not think that the goat was mad at all he only pretended to be in order to attract customers 
But Olof had maintained that he was mad, and in order to prove it, went to the market and bought a wretched little goat. And then it was plain enough to see that he was mad. Olof had only put the goat in front of him on the counter where his knives and things lay, and he had run away and left both his pack and his wares, and they had all laughed so awfully when they saw how frightened he was. And it was impossible that Ingrid could care for anyone who had been so crazy. It was no doubt unwise of Karin Landberg that she did not look at Ingrid whilst she told this story. If she had seen how she frowned, she would perhaps have taken warning. "'And you will marry anyone who could do such a thing,' Ingrid said. "'I think it would be better to marry the goat himself.' This Ingrid said in downright earnest, and it seemed so strange to Karin that she, who was always so gentle, should have said anything so unkind that it quite worried her for several days she was quite unhappy because she feared olof was not what she would like him to be it simply embittered karin's life until she made up her mind to tell olof everything but he was so nice and good that he quite reassured her it is not an easy task to wait for the spring in Värmland. one can have sun and warmth in the evening and the next morning find the ground white with snow. Gooseberry bushes and lawns may be green, but trees of the birch forest are bare, and seem as if they will never spring out. At Whitsuntine there was spring in the air, but Ingrid's prayers had been of no avail. Not a single setter girl had taken up her abode in the forest, not a fen was dry, it was impossible to go through the forest. On Whit Sunday, Ingrid and her adopted mother went to church. As it was such a great festival, they had driven to church. In olden days, Ingrid had very much enjoyed driving up to the church in full gallop, whilst people along the roadside politely took off their hats, and those who were standing on the road rushed to the side as if they were quite frightened but at the present moment she could not enjoy anything. Longing takes the fragrance from the rose, and the light from the full moon, says an old proverb. But Ingrid was glad for what she heard in church. It did her good to hear how the disciples were comforted in their longing. She was glad that Jesus thought of comforting those who longed so greatly for him. Whilst Ingrid and the rest of the congregation were in church, a tall dollar man came walking down the road. He wore a sheepskin coat and had a large pack on his back, like one who cannot tell winter from summer or Sunday from any other day. He did not go into the church, but stole timidly past the horses that were tied to the railings and went into the churchyard. He sat down on a grave and thought of all the dead who were still sleeping, and of one of the dead who had awakened to life again. He was still sitting there when the people left the church. Karin Landberg's Olof was one of the first to leave the church, and when he happened to look across the churchyard, he discovered the dollar man. It is hard to say whether it was curiosity or some other motive that prompted him but he went up to talk to him. He wanted to see if it were possible that he, who was supposed to have been cured, had become mad again. And it was possible. He told him at once that he sat there waiting for her, who was called Grave Lily. She was to come and play to him. She played so beautifully that the sun and the stars danced. Then Karin Landberg's Olof told him that she for whom he was waiting was standing outside the church. If he stood up, he could see her. She would no doubt be glad to see him. The pastor's wife and Ingrid were just getting into the carriage when a tall dollar man came running up to them. He came at a great pace in spite of all the horses he must curtsy to, 
and he beckoned eagerly to the young girl. As soon as Ingrid saw him, she stood quite still. She could not have told whether she was most glad to see him again or most grieved that he had again gone out of his mind. She only forgot everything else in the world. Her eyes began to sparkle. In that moment she saw nothing of the poor, wretched man. She only felt that she was once again near the beautiful soul of the man for whom she had longed so terribly. There were a great many people about, and they could not help looking at her. They could not take their eyes from her face. She did not move. She stood waiting for him. But those who saw how radiant she was with happiness must have thought that she was waiting for some great and noble man instead of a poor half-witted fellow they said afterwards that it almost seemed as if there were some affinity between his soul and hers some secret affinity which lay so deeply hidden beneath their consciousness that no human being could understand it but when hede was only a step or two from ingrid her adopted mother took her resolutely round the waist and lifted her into the carriage she would not have a scene between the two just outside the church with so many people present and as soon as they were in the carriage the man sent his horses off at full gallop a wild terrified cry was heard as they drove away the pastor's wife thanked god that she had got the young girl into the carriage it was still early in the afternoon when a peasant came to the parsonage to speak with the pastor he came to speak about the crazy dollar man he had now gone quite raving mad and they had been obliged to bind him what did the pastor advise them to do what should they do with him the pastor could give them no other advice but to take him home he told the peasant who he was and where he lived later on in the evening he told ingrid everything it was best to tell her the truth and trust to her own common sense but when night came it became clear to her that she had not time to wait for the spring the poor girl set out for munkhyttan by the high road she would no doubt be able to get there by that road although she knew that it was twice as long as the way through the forest it was whit monday late in the afternoon ingrid walked along the high road there was a wide expanse of country with low mountains and small patches of birch forest between the fields the mountain ash and the bird cherry were in bloom the light sticky leaves of the aspen were just out the ditches were full of clear rippling water which made the stones at the bottom glisten and sparkle ingrid walked sorrowfully along thinking of him whose mind had again given way wondering whether she could do anything for him whether it was of any use that she had left her home in this manner she was tired and hungry her shoes had begun to go to pieces perhaps it would be better for her to turn back she could never get to munkhyttan the further she walked the more sorrowful she became she could not help thinking that it could be of no use her coming now that he had gone quite out of his mind there was no doubt it was too late now it was quite hopeless to do anything for him but as soon as she thought of turning back she saw gunnar hede's face close to her cheek as she had so often seen it before it gave her new courage she felt as if he were calling for her she again felt hopeful and confident of being able to help him just as ingrid raised her head looking a little less downcast a queer little procession came towards her there was a little horse drawing a little cart a fat woman sat in the cart and a tall thin man with long thin moustaches walked by the side of it in the country where no one understood anything about art mr and mrs blomgren always went in for looking like ordinary people the little cart in which they travelled about 
was well covered over and no one could suspect that it only contained fireworks and conjuring apparatus and marionettes no one could suspect that the fat woman who sat on the top of the load looking like a well-to-do shopkeeper's wife was formerly miss viola who once sprang through the air or that the man who walked by her side and looked like a pensioned soldier was the same mr blomgren who occasionally to break the monotony of the journey took it into his head to turn a somersault over the horse and play the ventriloquist with thrushes and siskins that sang in the trees by the roadside so that he made them quite mad the horse was very small and had formerly drawn a roundabout and therefore it would never go unless it heard music on that account mrs blomgren generally sat playing the jew's harp but as soon as they met any one she put it in her pocket so that no one should discover they were artists for whom country people have no respect whatever owing to this they did not travel very fast but they were not in any hurry either the blind man who played the violin had to walk some little distance behind the others in order not to betray the fact of his belonging to the company the blind man was led by a little dog he was not allowed to have a child to lead him for that would always have reminded mr and mrs blomgren of a little girl who was called ingrid that would have been too sad and now they were all in the country on account of the spring for however much money mr and mrs blomgren were making in the towns they felt they must be in the country at that time of the year for mr and mrs blomgren were artists they did not recognize ingrid as she went past them without taking any notice of them for she was in a hurry she was afraid of their detaining her but directly afterwards she felt that it was heartless and unkind of her and turned back if ingrid could have felt glad about anything she would have been glad by seeing the old people's joy at meeting her you may be sure they had plenty to talk about the little horse turned its head time after time to see what was wrong with the roundabout strangely enough it was ingrid who talked the most the two old people saw at once that she had been crying and they were so concerned that she was obliged to tell them everything that had happened to her but it was a relief to ingrid to speak the old people had their own way of taking things they clapped their hands when she told them how she had got out of the grave and how she had frightened the pastor's wife they caressed her and praised her because she had run away from the parsonage for them nothing was dull or sad but everything was bright and hopeful they simply had no standard by which to measure reality and therefore its hardness could not affect them they compared everything they heard with the pieces from marionette theatres and pantomimes of course one also put a little sorrow and misery into the pantomime but that was only done to heighten the effect and of course everything would end well in the pantomimes it always ended well there was something infectious in all this hopefulness ingrid knew they did not all understand how great her trouble was but it was cheering all the same to listen to them but they were also real help to ingrid they told her that they had dinner a short time since at the inn at Toshoker and just as they were getting up from the table some peasants came driving up with a man who was mad mrs blomgren could not bear to see mad people and wanted to go away at once and mr blomgren had consented but supposing it was ingrid's madman and they had hardly said the words before ingrid said that it was very likely and wanted to set off at once mr blomgren then asked his wife in his own ceremonious manner if they were not in the country solely on account of the spring 
and if it were not just the same where they went and old mrs blomgren asked him equally ceremoniously in her turn if he thought she would leave her beloved ingrid before she had reached the harbour of her happiness then the old roundabout horse was turned and conversation grew more difficult because they again had to play on the jew's harp as soon as mrs blomgren wished to say anything she was obliged to hand the instrument to mr blomgren and when mr blomgren wanted to speak he gave it back again to his wife and the little horse stood still every time the instrument passed from mouth to mouth the whole time they did their best to comfort ingrid they related all the fairy tales they had seen represented at the dolls theatre they comforted her with the enchanted princess they comforted her with cinderella they comforted her with all the fairy tales under the sun mr and mrs blomgren watched ingrid when they saw that her eyes grew brighter artist's eyes they said nodding contentedly to each other what did we say artist's eyes in some incomprehensible manner they had got the idea that ingrid had become one of them an artist they thought she was playing a part in a drama it was a triumph for them in their old age on they went as fast as they could the old couple were only afraid that the madman would not be at the inn any longer but he was there and the worst of it was no one knew how to get him away end of section eight read by lars rolander Section nine from a Swedish homestead by Selma Lagerlöf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Lars Rolander. Section nine. The story of a country house. Part nine. The two peasants from Raglanda who had brought him had taken him to one of the rooms and locked him in whilst they were waiting for fresh horses. When they left him, his arms had been tied behind him, but he had somehow managed to free his hands from the cord, and when they came to fetch him, he was free and beside himself with rage, had seized a chair with which he threatened to strike anyone who approached him. They could do nothing but beat a hasty retreat and lock the door. The peasants now only waited for the landlord and his men to return and help them to bind him again all the hope which ingrid's old friends had reawakened within her was however not quenched she quite saw that gunnar hede was worse than he had ever been before but that was what she had expected she still hoped it was not their fairy tales it was their great love that had given her new hope she asked the men to let her go to the madman she said she knew him and he would not do her any harm but the peasant said they were not mad the man in the room would kill anybody who went in ingrid sat down to think she thought how strange it was that she should meet mr and mrs blomgren just to-day surely that meant something she would never have met them if it had not been for some purpose and ingrid thought of how he had regained his senses the last time could she not again make him do something which would remind him of olden days and drive away his mad thoughts she thought and thought mr and mrs blomgren sat on a seat outside the inn looking more unhappy than one would have thought was possible they were not far from crying ingrid their child came up to them with a smile such a smile as only she could have and stroked their old wrinkled cheeks and said it would please her so much if they would let her see a performance like those she used to see every day in the olden time it would be such a comfort to her at first they said no for they were not at all in proper artist humour 
but when she had expended a few smiles upon them they could not resist her they went to their cart and unpacked their costumes when they were ready they called for the blind man and ingrid selected the place where the performance was to be held she would not let them perform in the yard but took them into the garden belonging to the inn for there was a garden belonging to this inn it was mostly full of beds for vegetables which had not yet come up but here and there was an apple tree in bloom and ingrid said she would like them to perform under one of the apple trees in bloom some lads and servant girls came running when they heard the violin so there was a small audience but it was hard work for mr and mrs blomgren to perform ingrid had asked too much of them they were really much too sad and it was very unfortunate that ingrid had taken them out into the garden she had evidently not remembered that the rooms in the inn faced this way mrs blomgren was very nearly running away when she heard a window in one of the rooms quickly opened supposing the madman had heard the music and supposing he jumped out of the window and came to them but mrs blomgren was somewhat reassured when she saw who had opened the window it was a young gentleman with a pleasant face he was in shirt sleeves but otherwise very decently dressed his eyes was quiet his lips smiled and he stroked his hair back from his forehead with his hand mr blomgren was working and was so taken up with the performance that he did not notice anything mrs blomgren who had nothing else to do but kiss her hands in all directions had time to observe everything it was astonishing how radiant ingrid suddenly looked her eyes shone as never before and her face was so white that light seemed to come from it and all this radiancy was directed towards the man in the window he did not hesitate long he stood up on the window sill and jumped down to them and went up to the blind man and asked him to lend him his violin ingrid at once took the violin from the blind man and gave it to him play the waltz from the freischütz she said then the man began to play and ingrid smiled but she looked so unearthly that mrs blomgren almost thought that she would dissolve into a sunbeam and fly away from them but as soon as mrs blomgren heard the man play she knew him again is that how it is she said to herself is it he that was why she wanted to see two old people perform gunnar hede who had been walking up and down his room in such a rage that he felt inclined to kill someone had suddenly heard a blind man playing outside his window and that had taken him back to an incident in his former life he could not at first understand where his own violin was but then he remembered that aline had taken it away with him and now the only thing left for him to do was to try and borrow the blind man's violin to play himself quiet again he was so excited and as soon as he had got the violin in his hand he began to play it never occurred to him that he could not play he had no idea that for several years he had only been able to play some poor little tunes he thought all the time he was in Uppsala outside the house with the virginia creepers and he expected the acrobats would begin to dance as they had done last time he endeavoured to play with more life to make them do so but his fingers were stiff and awkward the bow would not properly obey them he exerted himself so much that the perspiration stood on his forehead at last however he got hold of the right tune the same they had danced to the last time he played it so enticingly so temptingly that it ought to have melted their hearts but the old acrobats did not begin to dance it was a long time since they had met the student at Uppsala, 
they did not remember how enthusiastic they were then they had no idea what he expected them to do gunnar hede looked at ingrid for an explanation why they did not dance when he looked at her there was such an unearthly radiance in her eyes that in his astonishment he gave up playing he stood a moment looking round the small crowd they all looked at him with such strange uneasy glances it was impossible to play with people staring at him so he simply went away from them there were some apple pears in bloom at the other end of the garden so he went there he saw now that nothing fitted in with the ideas he had just had that aline had locked him in and that he was at Uppsala. the garden was too large and the house was not covered with red creepers no it could not be Uppsala. but he did not mind very much where he was it seemed to him as if he had not played for centuries and now he had got hold of a violin now he would play he placed the violin against his cheek and began but again he was stopped by the stiffness in his fingers he could only play the very simplest things i shall have to begin at the beginning he said and he smiled and played a little minuet it was the first thing he had learnt his father had played it to him and he had afterwards played it from ear he saw all at once the whole scene before him and he heard the words the little prince should learn to dance but he broke his little leg then he tried to play several other small dances there were some he had played as a schoolboy they had asked him to play at the dancing lessons at the young ladies boarding school he could see the girls dance and swing about and could hear the dancing mistress beat the time with her foot then he grew bolder he played first violin in one of mozart's quartets when he learned that he was in the sixth form at the latin school at falun some old gentleman had practised this quartet for a concert but the first violin had been taken ill and he was asked to take his part young as he was he remembered how proud he had been gunnar he had only thought of getting his fingers into practice when he played these childish exercises but he soon noticed that something strange was happening to him he had a distinct sensation that in his brain there was some great darkness that hid his past as soon as he tried to remember anything it was as if he were trying to find something in a dark room but when he played some of the darkness vanished without his having thought of it the darkness had vanished so much that he could now remember his childhood and school life then he made up his mind to let himself be led by the violin perhaps it could drive away all the darkness and so it did for every piece he played the darkness vanished a little the violin led him through the one year after the other awoke in him memories of studies friends and pleasures the darkness stood like a wall before him but when he advanced against it armed with a violin it vanished step by step now and then he looked round to see whether it closed again behind him but behind him was bright day the violin came to a series of duets for piano and violin he only played a bar or two of each but a large portion of the darkness vanished he remembered his fiancée and his engagement he would like to have dwelt a little over this but there was still much darkness left to be played away he had no time he glided into a hymn he had heard it once when he was unhappy he remembered he was sitting in a village church when he heard it but why had he been unhappy because he went about the country selling goods like a poor peddler it was a hard life it was sad to think about it 
the bow went over the strings like a whirlwind and again cut through a large portion of the darkness now he saw the fifty-mile forest the snow-covered animals the weird shapes the drifts made of them he remembered the journey to see his fiancée remembered that she had broken the engagement all this became clear to him at one time he really felt neither sorrow nor joy over anything he remembered the most important thing was that he did remember this of itself was an unspeakable pleasure but all at once the bow stopped as if of its own accord it would not lead him any further and yet there was more much more that he must remember the darkness still stood like a solid wall before him he compelled the bow to go on and it played two quite common tunes the poorest he had ever heard how could his bow have learned such tunes the darkness did not vanish in the least for these tunes they really taught him nothing but from them came a terror which he could not remember having ever felt before an inconceivable awful fear the mad terror of a doomed soul he stopped playing he could not bear it what was there in these tunes what was there the darkness did not vanish for them and the awful thing was that it seemed to him that when he did not advance against the darkness with a violin and drive it before him it came gliding towards him to overwhelm him he had been standing playing with his eyes half closed now he opened them and looked into the world of reality he saw ingrid who had been standing listening to him the whole time he asked her not expecting an answer but simply to keep back the darkness for a moment when did i last play this tune but ingrid stood trembling she had made up her mind whatever happened now he should hear the truth afraid she was but at the same time full of courage and quite decided as to what she meant to do he should not again escape her not be allowed to slip away from her but in spite of her courage she did not dare to tell him straight out that these were the tunes he had played whilst he was out of his mind she evaded the question that was what you used to play at munkhyttan last winter she said hede felt as if he were surrounded by nothing but mysteries why did this young girl say du to him she was not a peasant girl Note, the peasants in the dalar district used formerly to address everybody by the pronoun du thou even when speaking to the king this custom is now however not so general her hair was dressed like other young ladies on the top of the head and in small curls her dress was home woven but she wore a lace collar she had small hands and a refined face this face with the large dreamy eyes could not belong to a peasant girl hede's memory could not tell him anything about her why did she then say du to him how did she know that he had played these tunes at home what is your name he said who are you i am ingrid whom you saw at upsala many years ago and whom you comforted because she could not learn to dance on the tightrope this went back to the time he could partly remember now he did remember her how tall and pretty you have grown ingrid he said and how fine you have become what a beautiful brooch you have he had been looking at her brooch for some time he thought he knew it it was like a brooch of enamel and pearls his mother used to wear the young girl answered at once your mother gave it to me you must have seen it before 
Gunnar Hede put down the violin and went up to Ingrid. He asked her almost violently, How is it possible? How can you wear her brooch? How is it that I don't know anything about your knowing my mother? Ingrid was frightened. She grew almost gray with terror. She knew already what the next question would be. I know nothing, Ingrid. I don't know why I am here. I don't know why you are here. Why don't I know all this? Oh, don't ask me. She went back a step or two and stretched out her hands as if to protect herself. Won't you tell me? Don't ask. Don't ask. He seized her roughly by the wrist to compel her to tell the truth. Tell me, I'm in my full senses. Why is there so much I can't remember? She saw something wild and threatening in his eyes. She knew now that she would be obliged to tell him. But she felt as if it were impossible to tell a man that he had been mad. It was much more difficult than she had thought. It was impossible, impossible. Tell me, he repeated. But she could tell from his voice that he would not hear it. He was almost ready to kill her if she told him. Then she summoned up all her love and looked straight into Gunnar Hede's eyes and said, You have not been quite right. Not for a long time? I don't quite know not for three or four years have i been out of my mind no no you have bought and sold and gone to the fairs in what way have i been mad you were frightened of whom was i frightened of animals of goats perhaps yes mostly of goats he had stood clutching her by the wrist the whole time he now flung her hand away from him, simply flung it. He turned away from Ingrid in a rage, as if she had maliciously told him an infamous lie. But this feeling gave way for something else which excited him still more. He saw before his eyes as distinctly as if it had been a picture, a tall dollar man weighed down by a huge pack. He was going into a peasant's house, but a wretched little dog came rushing at him. He stopped and curtsied and curtsied, and did not dare to go in until a man came out of the house, laughing, and drove the dog away. When he saw this, he again felt that terrible fear. In this anguish the vision disappeared, but then he heard voices. They shouted and shrieked around him. They laughed. Derision was showered upon him. Worst and loudest were the shrill voices of children. One word, one name came over and over again. It was shouted, shrieked, whispered, wheezed into his ear. The goat, the goat. And that all meant him, Gunnar Hede all that he had lived in he felt in full consciousness the same unspeakable fear he had suffered whilst out of his mind but now it was not fear for anything outside himself now he was afraid of himself it was i it was i he said wringing his hands the next moment he was kneeling against a low seat. He laid his head down and cried, cried. It was I. He moaned and sobbed. It was I. How could he have courage to bear this thought? Madman, scorned and laughed at by all. Oh, let me go mad again he said, hitting the seat with his fist. This is more than a human being can bear. He held his breath a moment. The darkness came towards him as the saviour he invoked. It came gliding towards him like a mist. A smile passed over his lips. 
he could feel the muscles of his face relax, feel that he again had the look of a madman. But that was better. The other he could not bear. To be pointed at, jeered at, scorned, mad. No, it was better to be so again and not to know it. Why should he come back to life? every one must loathe him the first light fleeting clouds of the great darkness began to enwrap him ingrid stood there seeing and hearing all his anguish not knowing but that all would soon be lost again she saw clearly that madness was again about to seize him she was so frightened so frightened all her courage had gone but before he again lost his senses and became so scared that he allowed no one to come near him she would at least take leave of him and of all her happiness gunnar hede felt that ingrid came and knelt down beside him laid her arm round his neck put her cheek to his and kissed him she did not think herself too good to come near him the madman did not think herself too good to kiss him there was a faint hissing in the darkness the mist lifted and it was as if serpents had raised their heads against him and now wheezed with anger that they could not reach to sting him do not be so unhappy ingrid said do not be so unhappy no one thinks of the past if you will only get well i want to be mad again he said i cannot bear it i cannot bear to think how i have been yes you can said ingrid no that no one can forget he moaned i was so dreadful no one can love me i love you she said he looked up doubtfully you kissed me in order that i should not go out of my mind again you pity me i will kiss you again she said you say that now because you think i am in need of hearing it are you in need of hearing that someone loves you if i am if i am ah child he said and tore himself away from her how can i possibly bear it when i know that every one who sees me thinks that fellow has been mad he has gone about curtsying for dogs and cats then he began again he lay crying with his face in his hands it is better to go out of one's mind again i can hear them shouting after me and i see myself and the anguish the anguish the anguish but then ingrid's patience came to an end yes that is right she cried go out of your mind again i'll call that manly to go mad in order to escape a little anguish she sat biting her lips struggling with her tears and as she could not get the words out quickly enough she seized him by the shoulder and shook him she was enraged and quite beside herself with anger because he would again escape her because he did not struggle and fight what do you care about me what do you care about your mother you go mad and then you will have peace she shook him again by the arm to be saved from anguish you say but you don't care about one who has been waiting for you all her life if you had any thought for any one but yourself you would fight against this and get well but you have no thought for others you can come so touchingly in visions and dreams and beg for help but in reality you will not have any help you imagine that your sufferings are greater than any one else's but there are others who have suffered more than you at last gunnar hede raised his eyes and looked her straight in the face 
She was anything but beautiful at this moment. Tears were streaming down her cheeks, and her lips trembled while she tried to get out the words between her sobs. But in his eyes her emotion only made her more beautiful. A wonderful peace came over him, and a great and humble thankfulness. Something great and wonderful had come to him in his deepest humiliation. It must be a great love, a great love. He had sat bemoaning his wretchedness, and love came and knocked at his door. He would not merely be tolerated when he came back to life. People would not only with difficulty refrain from laughing at him. There was one who loved him and longed for him. She spoke hardly to him, but he heard love trembling in every single word. He felt as if she were offering him thrones and kingdoms. She told him that whilst he had been out of his mind, he had saved her life. He had awakened her from the dead, had helped her, protected her. But this was not enough for her. She would possess him altogether. When she kissed him, he had felt a life-giving balm enter his sick soul but he had hardly dared to think that it was love that made her. But he could not doubt her anger and her tears. He was beloved. He, poor wretched creature, he who had been held in derision by everybody, and before the great and humble bliss which now filled Gunnar Hede vanished the last darkness. It was drawn aside like a heavy curtain, and he saw plainly before him the region of terror through which he had wandered. But there, too, he had met Ingrid. There he had lifted her from the grave. There he had played for her at the hut in the forest. There she had striven to heal him. But only the memory of her came back. The feelings with which she had formerly inspired him now awoke. Love filled his whole being. He felt the same burning longing that he had felt in the churchyard at Raglanda when she was taken from him. In that region of terror, in that great desert, there had at any rate grown one flower that had comforted him with fragrance and beauty and now he felt that love would dwell with him for ever the wild flower of the desert had been transplanted into the garden of life and had taken root and grown and thriven and when he felt this he knew he was saved he knew that the darkness had found its master ingrid was silent she was tired as one is tired after hard work but she was also content for she felt she had carried out her work in the best possible manner she knew she had conquered at last gunnar hede broke the silence i promise you that i will not give in he said thank you ingrid answered nothing more was said Gunnar Hede thought he would never be able to tell her how much he loved her. It could never be told in words, only shown every day and every hour of his life. End of section 9 Read by Lars Rolander Section 10 of From a Swedish Homestead by Selma Lagerlöf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Lars Rolander. Section 10. Queens at Kungahalla on the site of the Great Kungahalla. Should a stranger who had heard about the old city of Kungahalla ever visit the site on the northern river where it once lay, 
he would assuredly be much surprised. He would ask himself whether churches and fortifications could melt away like snow, or if the earth had opened and swallowed them up. He stands on a spot where formerly there was a mighty city, and he cannot find a street or a landing stage. He sees neither ruins nor traces of devastating fires. He only sees a country seat surrounded by green trees and red outbuildings. He sees nothing but broad meadows and fields, where the plough does its work year after year, without being hindered either by brick foundations or old pavements. He would probably first of all go down to the river. He would not expect to see anything of the great ships that went to the Baltic ports or to distant Spain but he would in all likelihood think that he might find traces of the old shipyards of the large boathouses and landing stages he presumes that he will find some of the old kilns where they used to refine salt he will see the worn-out pavement of the main street that led to the harbour he will inquire about the german pier and the swedish pier he would like to see the weeping bridge where the women of Kungahalla took leave of their husbands and sons when they went to distant lands. But when he comes down to the river's edge, he sees nothing but a forest of waving reeds. He sees a road full of holes leading down to the ferry. He sees a couple of common barges and a little flat-bottomed ferry boat that is taking a peasant cart over to Hisingen but no big ships come gliding up the river he does not even see any dark hulls lying and rotting at the bottom of the river as he does not find anything remarkable down at the harbour he will probably begin to look for the celebrated convent hill he expects to see traces of the palisading and ramparts which in olden days surrounded it he is hoping to see the ruins of the high walls and the long cloisters he says to himself that anyhow there must be ruins of that magnificent church where the cross was kept that miracle-working cross which had been brought from jerusalem he thinks of the number of monuments covering the holy hills which rise over the ancient cities and his heart begins to beat with glad expectation but when he comes to the old convent hill which rises above the fields he finds nothing but clusters of murmuring trees he finds neither walls nor towers nor gables perforated with pointed arched windows garden seats and benches he will find under the shadow of the trees but no cloisters decorated with pillars no hewn gravestones well if he has not found anything here he will in any case try to find the old king's hall. He thinks about the large halls from which Kungahalla is supposed to have derived its name. It might be that there was something left of the timber, a yard thick, that formed the walls, or of the deep cellars under the great hall, where the Norwegian kings celebrated their banquets. He thinks of the smooth green courtyard of the king's hall, where the kings used to ride their silver-shod chargers, and where the queens used to milk the golden-horned cows. He thinks of the lofty lady's bower, of the brewing-room with its large boilers, of the huge kitchen, where half an ox at a time was placed in the pot, and where a whole hog was roasted on the spit. He thinks of the serf's house, of the falcon's cages, of the great pantries house by house all round the courtyard moss grown with age decorated with dragon's heads of such a number of buildings there must be some traces left he thinks but should he then inquire for the old king's hall he will be taken to a modern country house with glass veranda and conservatories the king's seat has vanished and with it all the drinking horns inlaid with silver and the shields covered with skin one cannot even show him the well-kept courtyard with its short close grass and with narrow paths of black earth 
He sees strawberry beds and hedges of rose trees. He sees happy children and young girls dancing under apple and pear trees. But he does not see strong men wrestling or knights playing at ball. Perhaps he asks about the great oak on the marketplace, beneath which the kings sat in judgment, and where the twelve stones of judgment were set up, or about the long street, which was said to be seven miles long, or about the rich merchants' houses, separated by dark lanes, each having its own landing stage and boathouse down by the river or about the marie church in the market-place where the seamen brought their offerings of small full-rigged ships and the sorrowful small silver hearts but there is nothing left to show him of all these things cows and sheep graze where the long street used to be rye and barley grow on the market-place and stables and barns stand where people used to flock round the tempting market stalls. How can he help feeling disappointed? Is there not a single thing to be found, he says, not a single relic left? And he thinks perhaps that they have been deceiving him. The great Kungahalla can never have stood here, he says. It must have stood in some other place. Then they take him down to the riverside and show him a roughly hewn stone block, and they scrape away the silver gray lichen so that he can see there are some figures hewn in the stone. He will not be able to understand what they represent. They will be as incomprehensible to him as the spots in the moon, but they will assure him that they represent a ship and an elk and that they were cut in the stone in the olden days to commemorate the foundation of the city and should he still not be able to understand they will tell him what is the meaning of the inscription on the stone the forest queen marcus antonius popius was a roman merchant of high standing he traded with distant lands and from the harbour at ostia he sent well-equipped triremas to spain to britain and even to the north coast of germany fortune favoured him and he amassed immense riches which he hoped to leave as an inheritance to his only son unfortunately this only son had not inherited his father's ability this happens unfortunately all the world over a rich man's only son need one say more it is and always will be the same story one would almost think that the gods give rich men these incorrigible idlers these dull pale languid fools of sons to show man what unutterable folly it is to amass riches when will the eyes of mankind be opened when will men listen to the warning voice of the gods young silvius antonius popius at the age of twenty had already tried all the pleasures of life he was also fond of letting people see that he was tired of them but in spite of that one did not notice any diminution in the eagerness with which he sought them on the contrary he was quite in despair when a singularly persistent ill luck began to pursue him and to interfere with all his pleasures his numidian horses fell lame the day before the great chariot race of the year his elite love affairs were found out his cleverest cook died from malaria this was more than enough to crush a man whose strength had not been hardened by exertion and toil young popius felt so unhappy that he made up his mind to take his own life he seemed to think that this was the only way in which he could cheat the god of misfortune who pursued him and made his life a burden one can understand that an unhappy creature commits suicide in order to escape the persecution of man but only a fool like silvius antonius could think of adopting such means to flee from the gods 
one recalls involuntarily the story of the man who to escape from the lion sprang right into its open jaws young silvius was much too effeminate to choose a bloody death neither had he any inclination to die from a painful poison after careful consideration he resolved to die the gentle death of the waves but when he went down to the tiber to drown himself he could not make up his mind to give his body to the dirty sluggish water of the river for a long time he stood undecided staring into the stream then he was seized by the magic charm which lies dreamily over a river he felt that great holy longing which fills these never-resting wanderers of nature he would see the sea i will die in the clear blue sea through which the sun's rays penetrate right to the bottom said silvius antonius my body shall rest upon the couch of pink coral the foamy waves which i set in motion when i sink into the deep shall be snow-white and fresh they shall not be like the sooty froth which lies quivering at the riverside he immediately hurried home had his horses harnessed and drove to ostia he knew that one of his father's ships was lying in the harbour ready to sail young popius drove his horses at a furious pace and he succeeded in getting on board just as the anchor was being weighed of course he did not think it necessary to take any baggage with him he did not even trouble to ask the skipper for what place the craft was bound to the sea they were going in any case that was enough for him nor was it very long before the young suicide reached the goal of his desire the trirema passed the mouth of the tiber and the mediterranean lay before silvius antonius its sparkling waves bathed in sun its beauty made silvius antonius believe in the poet's assertion that the swelling ocean is but a thin veil which covers the most beautiful world he felt bound to believe that he who boldly makes his way through this cover will immediately reach the sea god's palace of pearls the young man congratulated himself that he had chosen this manner of death and one could scarcely call it that it was impossible to believe that this beautiful water could kill it was only the shortest road to a land where pleasure is not a delusion leaving nothing but distaste and loathing he could only with difficulty suppress his eagerness but the whole deck was full of sailors even silvius could understand that if he now sprang into the sea the consequence would simply be that one of his father's sailors would quickly spring overboard and fish him out as soon as the sails were set and the oarsmen were well in swing the skipper came up to him and saluted him with the greatest politeness you intend then to go with me to germany my silvius he said you do me great honour young popius suddenly remembered that this man used never to return from a voyage without bringing him some curious thing or other from the barbarous countries he had visited sometimes it was a couple of pieces of wood with which the savages made fire sometimes it was the black horn of an ox which they used as a drinking vessel sometimes a necklace of bear's teeth which had been a great chief's mark of distinction the good man beamed with joy at having his master's son on board his ship he saw in it a new proof of the wisdom of old popius in sending his son to distant lands instead of letting him waste more time amongst the effeminate young roman idlers young popius did not wish to undeceive him he was afraid that if he disclosed his intention the skipper would at once turn back with him verily galenus he said i would gladly accompany you on this voyage but i fear i must ask you to put me ashore at Badje. 
I made up my mind too late. I have neither clothes nor money. But Galenus assured him that that need was soon remedied. Was he not upon his father's well-appointed vessel? He should not want for anything. Neither warm fur tunic when the weather was cold, or light Syrian clothing of the kind that seamen wear when they cruise in fair weather in the friendly seas between the islands. Three months after their departure from Ostia, Galenus's Trirema rode in amongst a cluster of rocky islands. Neither the skipper nor any of his crew were quite clear as to where they really were, but they were glad to take shelter for a time from the storms that raged on the open sea. One could almost think that Silvius Antonius was right in his belief that some deity persecuted him. No one on the ship had ever before experienced such a voyage. The luckless sailors said to each other that they had not had fair weather for two days since they left Ostia. The one storm had followed upon the other. They had undergone the most terrible sufferings. They had suffered hunger and thirst, whilst they, day and night, exhausted and almost fainting, from want of sleep, had had to manage sails and oars. The fact of the seamen being unable to trade had added to their despondency. How could they approach the coast and display their wares on the shore to effect an exchange in such weather? On the contrary, every time they saw the coast appear through the obstinate heavy mist that surrounded them, they had been compelled to put out to sea again for fear of the foam-decked rocks. One night, when they struck on a rock, they had been obliged to throw the half of their cargo into the sea. And as for the other half, they dared not think about it, as they feared it was completely spoiled by the breakers which had rolled over the ship. Certain it was that Silvius Antonius had proved himself not to be lucky at sea either. Silvius Antonius was still living. He had not drowned himself. It is difficult to say why he prolonged an existence which could not be of any more pleasure to him now than when he first made up his mind to cut it short. Perhaps he had hoped that the sea would have taken possession of him without he himself doing anything to bring it about. Perhaps his love for the sea had passed away during its bursts of anger. Perhaps he had resolved to die in the opal-green perfumed water of his bath. But had Galenus and his men known why the young man had come on board, they would assuredly have bitterly complained that he had not carried out his intention, for they were all convinced that it was his presence which had called forth their misfortunes. Many a dark night Galenus had feared that the sailors would throw him into the sea. More than one of them related that in the terrible stormy nights he had seen dark hands stretching out of the water, grasping after the ship, and they did not think it was necessary to cast lots to find out who it was that these hands wanted to draw down into the deep. Both the skipper and the crew did Silvius Antonus the special honor to think that it was for his sake these storms rent the air and scourged the sea. If Silvius during this time had behaved like a man, if he had taken his share of their work and anxiety, then perhaps some of his companions might have had pity upon him as a being who had wrought upon himself the wrath of the gods. But the young man had not understood how to win their sympathy. He had only thought of seeking shelter for himself from the wind, and of sending them to fetch furs and rugs from the stores for his protection from the cold. But for the moment all complaints over his presence had ceased, as soon as the storm had succeeded in driving the Trirema into the quiet waters between the islands, its rage was spent. It behaved like a sheep-dog that becomes silent and keeps quiet as soon as it sees the sheep on the right way to the fold. The heavy clouds disappeared from the sky. The sun shone. 
For the first time during the voyage the sailors felt the joys of summer spreading over nature. Upon these storm-beaten men the sunshine and the warmth had almost an intoxicating effect. Instead of longing for rest and sleep, they became as merry as happy children in the morning. They expected they would find a large continent behind all these rocks and boulders. They hoped to find people, and, who could tell, on this foreign coast which had probably never before been visited by a Roman ship, their wares would no doubt find a ready sail. In that case they might after all do some good business, and bring back with them skins of bear and elk, and large quantities of white wax and golden amber. Whilst the trirema slowly made its way between the rocks, which grew higher and higher, and richer with verdure and trees, the crew made haste to decorate it so that it could attract the attention of the barbarians the ship which even without any decoration was a beautiful specimen of human handiwork soon rivalled in splendor the most gorgeous bird recently tossed about by storms and ravaged by tempests it now bore on its topmast a golden sceptre and sails striped with purple in the bows a resplendent figure of neptune was raised and in the stern a tent of many-coloured silken carpets and do not think the sailors neglected to hang the sides of the ship with rugs the fringes of which trailed in the water or to wind the long oars of the ship with golden ribbons neither did the crew of the ship wear the clothes they had worn during the voyage and which the sea and the storm had done their best to destroy they arrayed themselves in white garments wound purple scarves round their waists and placed glittering bands in their hair even silvius antonius roused himself from his apathy it was as if he was glad of having at last found something to do which he thoroughly understood he was shaved had his hair trimmed and his whole person rubbed over with fragrant scents then he put on a flowing robe hung a mantle over his shoulders and chose from the large casket of jewels which galenus opened for him rings and bracelets necklaces and a golden belt when he was ready he flung aside the purple curtains of the silken tent and laid himself on a couch in the opening of the tent in order to be seen by the people on the shore during these preparations the sea became narrower and narrower and the sailors discovered that they were entering the mouth of a river the water was fresh and there was land on both sides the trirema glided slowly onwards up the sparkling river the weather was brilliant and the whole of nature was gloriously peaceful and how the magnificent merchantman enlivened the great solitude on both sides of the river primeval forests high and thick met their view pine trees grew right to the water's edge the river in its eternal course had washed away the earth from the roots and the hearts of the seamen were moved with solemn awe at the sight not only of these venerable trees but even more by that of the naked roots which resembled the mighty limbs of a giant here they thought man will never succeed in planting corn here the ground will never be cleared for the building of a city or even a farmstead for miles round the earth is woven through with this network of roots hard as steel this alone is sufficient to make the dominion of the forest everlasting and unchangeable along the river the trees grew so close and their branches were so entangled that they formed firm impenetrable walls these walls of prickly firs were so strong and high that no fortified city need wish for stronger defences but here and there there was all the same an opening in this wall of firs 
It was the paths the wild beasts had made on their way to the river to drink. Through these openings the strangers could obtain a glimpse of the interior of the forest. They had never seen anything like it. In sunless twilight there grew trees with trunks of greater circumference than the gate towers on the walls of Rome. There was a multitude of trees fighting with each other for light and air. Trees drove and struggled. Trees were crippled and weighed down by other trees. Trees took root in the branches of other trees. Trees drove and fought as if they had been human beings. But if man or beast moved in this world of trees, they must have other moods of making their way than those which the Romans knew. For from the ground right up to the top of the forest was a network of stiff bare branches. From these branches fluttered long tangles of grey lichen, transforming the trees into weird beings with hair and beard. And beneath them the ground was covered with rotten and rotting trunks, and one's feet would have sunk into the decayed wood as into melting snow. The forest sent forth a fragrance which had a drowsy effect upon the men on board the ship. It was the strong odor of resin and wild honey that blended with a sickly smell from the decayed wood and from innumerable gigantic red and yellow mushrooms. There was no doubt something awe-inspiring in all this, but it was also elevating to see nature in all its power before man had yet interfered with its dominion. It was not long before one of the sailors began to sing a hymn to the god of the forest, and involuntarily the whole crew joined in. They had quite given up all thoughts of meeting human beings in this forest world. Their hearts were filled with pious thoughts. They thought of the forest god and his nymphs. They said to themselves that when Pan was driven from the woods of Hellas, he must have taken refuge here in the far north. With pious songs they entered his kingdom. Every time there was a pause in the song, they heard a gentle music from the forest. The tops of the fir trees, vibrating in the noonday heat, sang and played. The sailors often discontinued their song in order to listen if Pan was not playing upon his flute the oarsmen rowed slower and slower the sailors gazed searchingly into the golden green and black violet water flowing under the fir trees they peered between the tall reeds which quivered and rustled in the wash of the ship they were in such a state of expectation that they started at the sight of the white water lilies that shone in the dark water between the reeds and again they sang the song Pan, thou ruler of the forest. They had given up all thoughts of trading. They felt that they stood at the entrance to the dwelling of the gods. All earthly cares had left them. Then, all of a sudden, at the outlet of one of the tracks, there stood an elk, a royal deer with broad forehead and a forest of antlers on its horns. There was a breathless silence on the trirema. They stemmed the oars to slacken speed. Silvius Antonius arose from his purple couch. All eyes were fixed upon the elk. They thought they could discern that it carried something on its back, but the darkness of the forest and the drooping branches made it impossible to see distinctly. The huge animal stood for a long time and scented the air with its muscle turned towards the trirema. At last it seemed to understand that there was no danger. It made a step towards the water. Behind the broad horns one could now discern more distinctly something light and white. They wondered if the elk carried on its back a harvest of wild roses. The crew gently plied their oars. The trirema drew nearer to the animal. 
which gradually moved towards the edge of the reeds the elk strode slowly into the water put down its feet carefully so as not to be caught by the roots at the bottom behind the horns one could now distinctly see the face of a maiden surrounded by fair hair the elk carried on its back one of those nymphs whom they had been expectantly awaiting and whom they felt sure would be found in this primeval world a holy enthusiasm filled all the men on the trirema one of them who hailed from sicily remembered a song which he had heard in his youth when he played on the flowery plains around syracuse he began to sing softly nymph amongst flowers born arethusa by name thou who in sheltered wood wanders white like the moon and when the weather-beaten men understood the words they tried to subdue the storm-like roar in their voices in order to sing nymph amongst flowers born arethusa by name they steered the ship nearer and nearer the reeds they did not heed that it had already once or twice touched the bottom but the young forest maiden sat and played hide-and-seek between the horns one moment she hid herself the next she peeped out she did not stop the elk she drove it further into the river when the elk had gone some little distance she stroked it to make it stop then she bent down and gathered two or three water lilies the men on the ship looked a little foolishly at each other the nymph had then come solely for the purpose of plucking the white water lilies that rocked on the waters of the river she had not come for the sake of the roman seamen then silvius antonius drew a ring from off his finger sent up a shout that made the nymph look up and threw her the ring she stretched out her hand and caught it her eyes sparkled she stretched out her hands for more silvius antonius again threw a ring then she flung the water lilies back into the river and drove the elk further into the water now and again she stopped but then a ring came flying from silvius antonius and enticed her further all at once she overcame her hesitation the colour rose in her cheeks she came nearer to the ship without it being necessary to tempt her the water was already up to the shoulders of the elk she came right under the side of the vessel the sailors hung over the gunwale to help the beautiful nymph should she wish to go on board the trirema but she saw only silvius antonius as he stood there decked with pearls and rings and fair as the sunrise and when the young roman saw that the eyes of the nymph were fastened upon him he leant over even further than the others they cried to him that he should take care lest he should lose his balance and fall into the sea but this warning came too late it is not known whether the nymph with a quick movement drew silvius antonius to her or how it really happened but before any one thought of grasping him he was overboard all the same there was no danger of silvius antonius drowning the nymph stretched forth her lovely arms and caught him in them he hardly touched the surface of the water at the same moment her steed turned rushed through the water and disappeared in the forest and loudly rang the laugh of the wild rider as she carried off silvius antonius calenus and his men stood for a moment horror-stricken then some of the men involuntarily threw off their clothes to swim to the shore but galenus stopped them without doubt this is the will of the gods he said now we see the reason why they have brought silvius antonius popius through a thousand storms to this unknown land let us be glad that we have been an instrument in their hands and let us not seek to hinder their will 
The seamen obediently took their oars and rowed down the river, softly singing to their even stroke the song of Arethusa's flight. When one has finished this story, surely the stranger must be able to understand the inscription on the old stone. He must be able to see both the elk with its many antlered horns and the trirema with its long oars. One does not expect that he shall be able to see Silvius Antonius Popius and the beautiful queen of the primeval forest, for in order to see them he must have the eyes of the relators of fairy tales of bygone days. He will understand that the inscription hails from the young Roman himself, and that this also applies to the whole of the old story. Silvius Antonius has handed it down to his descendants, word for word. He knew that it would gladden their hearts to know that they sprang from the world-famed Romans. But the stranger, of course, need not believe that any of Pan's nymphs have wandered here by the river's side. He understands quite well that a tribe of wild men have wandered about in the primeval forest, and that the rider of the elk was the daughter of the king who ruled over these people, and that the maiden who carried off Silvius Antonius would only rob him of his jewels and that she did not at all think of silvius antonius himself scarcely knew perhaps that he was a human being like herself and the stranger can also understand that the name of silvius antonius would have been forgotten long ago in this country had he remained the fool he was he will hear how misfortune and want roused the young roman so that from being the despised slave of the wild men he became their king it was he who attacked the forest with fire and steel he erected the first firmly timbered house he built vessels and planted corn he laid the foundation of the power and glory of great kungahalla and when the stranger hears this he looks around the country with a more contented glance than before for even if the site of the city has been turned into fields and meadows and even if the river no longer boasts of busy craft still this is the ground that has enabled him to breathe the air of the land of dreams and shown him visions of bygone days end of section ten Red by Lars Rolander. Section eleven of From a Swedish Homestead by Selma Lagerlöf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Reading by Lars Rolander. Section eleven. Queens at Kungahalla, Sigrid Storrode. Once upon a time there was an exceedingly beautiful spring. It was the very spring that the Swedish queen, Sigrid Storrode, summoned the Norwegian King Olaf Tryggveson to meet her at Kungahalla in order to settle about their marriage. It was strange that King Olaf would marry Queen Sigrid, for although she was fair and well gifted, she was a wicked heathen, whilst King Olaf was a Christian, who thought of nothing but building churches and compelling the people to be baptized. But maybe the king thought that God the Almighty would convert her. But it was even more strange that when Storrode had announced to King Olaf's messenger that she would set out for Kungahalla as soon as the sea was no longer ice-bound, spring should come almost immediately cold and snow disappeared at the time when winter is usually at its height and when storrode made known that she would begin to equip her ships the ice vanished from the fjords the meadows became green and although it was yet a long time to lady day the cattle could already be put out to grass when the queen rode between the rocks of east gothland into the baltic 
she heard the cuckoo's song although it was so early in the year that one could scarcely expect to hear the lark and great joy prevailed everywhere when storrode proceeded on her way all the trolls who had been obliged to flee from norway during king olaf's reign because they could not bear the sound of the church bells came on the rocks when they saw storrode sailing past they pulled up young birch trees by the roots and waved them to the queen and then they went back to their rocky dwellings where their wives were sitting full of longing and anxiety and said woman thou shalt not be cast down any longer storrode is now sailing to king olaf now we shall soon return to norway when the queen sailed past cullen the kulla troll came out of his cave and he made the black mountain open so that she saw the gold and silver veins which twisted through it and it made the queen happy to see his riches when storrode went past the holland rivers the nixi came down from his waterfall swam right out to the mouth of the river and played upon his harp so that the ship danced upon the waves when she sailed past the needing rocks the mermen lay there and blew upon their seashell horns and made the water splash in frothy pillars and when the wind was against them the most loathsome trolls came out of the deep to help storrode's ship over the waves some lay at the stern and pushed others took ropes of seaweed in their mouth and harnessed themselves before the ship like horses the wild heathen for whom king olaf would not allow to remain in the country on account of their great wickedness came rowing towards the queen's ship with sails furled and with their pole-axes raised as if for attack but when they recognized the queen they allowed her to pass unhurt and shouted after her we empty a beaker to thy wedding storrode all the heathen who lived along the coast laid firewood upon their stone altars and sacrificed both sheep and goats to the old gods in order that they should aid storrode in her expedition to the norwegian king when the queen sailed up the northern river a mermaid swam alongside the ship stretched her white arm out of the water and gave her a large clear pearl wear this storrode she said then king olaf will be so bewitched by thy beauty that he will never be able to forget thee when the queen had sailed a short distance up the river she heard such a roar and such a rushing noise that she expected to find a waterfall the further she proceeded the louder grew the noise but when she rode past the golden isle and passed into the broad bay she saw at the riverside the great kungahalla the town was so large that as far as she could see up the river there was house after house all imposing and well timbered with many outhouses narrow lanes between the grey wooden walls led down to the river there were large courtyards before the dwelling houses well laid pathways went from each house down to its boathouse and landing stage storrode commanded her men to row quite slowly she herself stood on the poop of the ship and looked towards the shore never before have i seen the like of this she said she now understood that the roar she had heard was nothing but the noise of the work which went on at kungahalla in the spring when the ships were being made ready for their long cruises she heard the smiths hammering with huge sledge-hammers the baker's shovel clattered in the ovens beams were hoisted on to the heavy lighters with much crashing noise young men planned oars and stripped the bark from the trees which were to be used for masts she saw green courtyards where handmaidens were twining ropes for the seafaring men and where old men sat mending the grave vadmal sails she saw boat builders tearing the new boats enormous nails were driven into strong oaken planks the hulls of the ships were hauled out of the boathouses to be tightened old ships were done up with freshly painted dragon heads goods were stowed away people took a hurried leave of each other heavily filled ships chests were carried on board ships that were ready to sail left the shore storrode saw that the vessels rowing up the river were heavily laden with herrings and salt 
but those making for the open sea were laden high up the masts with costly oak timber hides and skins when the queen saw all this she laughed with joy she thought that she would willingly marry king olaf in order to rule over such a city storrade rode up to the king's landing stage there king olaf stood ready to receive her and when she advanced to meet him he thought that she was the fairest woman he had ever seen they then proceeded to the king's hall and there was great harmony and friendship between them when they went to the table storrade laughed and talked the whole time the bishop was saying grace and the king laughed and talked also because he saw that it pleased storrade when the meal was finished and they all folded their hands to listen to the bishop's prayer storrade began to tell the king about her riches she continued doing this as long as the prayer lasted and the king listened to storrade and not to the bishop the king placed storrade in the seat of honor whilst he sat at her feet and storrade told him how she had caused two minor kings to be burned to death for having had the presumption to woo her the king was glad at hearing this and thought that all minor kings who had the audacity to woo a woman like storrade should share the same fate when the bells rang for evensong the king rose to go to the marie church to pray as was his wont but then storrade called for her bard and he sang the lay of brynhild budel's daughter who caused sigurd fofnersbane to be slain and king olaf did not go to church but instead sat and looked into storrade's radiant eyes under the thick black arched eyebrows and he understood that storrade was brynhild and that she would kill him if he ever forsook her he also thought that she was no doubt a woman who would be willing to burn on the pile with him and whilst the priests were saying mass and praying in the marie church at kungahalla king olaf sat thinking that he would ride to valhalla with sigrid storrade before him on the horse that night the ferryman who conveyed people over the Göta river was busier than he had ever been before time after time he was called to the other side but when he crossed over there was never anybody to be seen but all the same he heard steps around him and the boat was so full that it was nearly sinking he rode the whole night backwards and forwards and did not know what it could all mean but in the morning the whole shore was full of small footprints and in the footprints the ferryman found small withered leaves which on closer examination proved to be pure gold and he understood they were the brownies and the dwarfs who had fled from norway when it became a christian country and who had now come back again and the giant who lived in the fortin mountain right to the east of kungahalla threw one big stone after the other at the marie church the whole night through and had not the giant been so strong that all the stones went too far and fell down at hissingen on the other side of the river a great disaster would assuredly have happened every morning king olaf was in the habit of going to mass but the day storrade was at kungahalla he thought he had not the time as soon as he arose he at once wanted to go down to the harbour where her ship lay in order to ask her if she would drink the wedding cup with him before eventide the bishop had caused the bells to be rung the whole morning and when the king left the king's hall and went across the market-place the church doors were thrown open and beautiful singing was heard from within but the king went on as if he had not heard anything the bishop ordered the bells to be stopped the singing ceased and the candles were extinguished it all happened so suddenly that the king involuntarily stopped and looked towards the church and it seemed to him that the church was more insignificant than he had ever before thought it was smaller than the houses in the town the peat roof hung heavily over its low walls without windows the door was low with a small projecting roof covered with fir bark whilst the king stood thinking a slender young woman came out of the dark church door she wore a red robe and a blue mantle and she bore in her arms a child with fair locks her dress was poor 
and yet it seemed to the king that he had never before seen a more noble-looking woman she was tall dignified and fair of face the king saw with emotion that the young woman pressed the child close to her and carried it with such care that one could see it was the most precious thing she possessed in the world as the woman stood in the doorway she turned her gentle face round and looked back looked into the poor dark little church with great longing in look and mien when she again turned round towards the market-place there were tears in her eyes but just as she was about to step over the threshold into the market-place her courage failed her she leant against the door-posts and looked at the child with a troubled glance as if to say where in all the wide world shall we find roof over our heads the king stood immovable and looked at the homeless woman what touched him the most was to see the child who lay in her arms free from sorrow stretch out his hand with a flower towards her as if to win a smile from her and then he saw she tried to drive away the sorrow from her face and smile at her son who can that woman be thought the king it seems to me that i have seen her before she is undoubtedly a high-born woman who is in trouble however great a hurry the king was in to go to storrode he could not take his eyes away from the woman it seemed to him that he had seen these tender eyes and this gentle face before but where he could not call to mind the woman still stood in the church door as if she could not tear herself away then the king went up to her and asked why art thou so sorrowful i am turned out of my home answered the woman pointing to the little dark church the king thought she meant that she had taken refuge in the church because she had no other place to go to he again asked who hath turned thee out she looked at him with an unutterably sorrowful glance dost thou not know she asked but then the king turned away from her he had no time to stand guessing riddles he thought it appeared as if the woman meant that it was he who had turned her out he did not understand what she could mean the king went on quickly he went down to the king's landing stage where storrode's ship was lying at the harbour the queen's servants met the king their clothes were braided with gold and they wore silver helmets on their heads storrode stood on her ship looking towards kungahalla rejoicing in its power and wealth she looked at the city as if she already regarded herself as its queen but when the king saw storrode he thought at once of the gentle woman who poor and sorrowful had been turned out of the church what is this he thought it seems to me as if she were fairer than storrode when storrode greeted him with smiles he thought of the tears that sparkled in the eyes of the other woman the face of the strange woman was so clear to king olaf that he could not help comparing it feature for feature with storrode's and when he did that all storrode's beauty vanished he saw that storrode's eyes were cruel and her mouth sensual in each of her features he saw a sin he could still see she was beautiful but he no longer took pleasure in her countenance he began to loathe her as if she were a beautiful poisonous snake when the queen saw the king come a victorious smile passed over her lips i did not expect thee so early king olaf she said i thought thou wast at mass the king felt an irresistible inclination to contradict storrode and do everything she did not want mass has not yet begun he said i have come to ask thee to go with me to the house of my god when the king said this he saw an angry look in storrode's eyes but she continued to smile rather come to me on my ship she said and i will show thee the presents i have brought for thee she took up a sword inlaid with gold as if to tempt him but the king thought all the time that he could see the other woman at her side and it appeared to him that storrode stood amongst her treasures like a foul dragon answer me first said the king 
if thou wilt go with me to church what have i to do in thy church she asked mockingly then she saw that the king's brow darkened and she perceived that he was not of the same mind as the day before she immediately changed her manner and became gentle and submissive go thou to church as much as thou likest even if i do not go there shall be no discord between us on that account the queen came down from the ship and went up to the king she held in her hand a sword and a mantle trimmed with fur which she would give him but in the same moment the king happened to look towards the harbour at some distance he saw the other woman her head was bowed and she walked with weary steps but she still bore the child in her arms what art thou looking so eagerly after king olaf storrade asked then the other woman turned round and looked at the king and as she looked at him it appeared to him as if a ring of golden light surrounded her head and that of the child more beautiful than the crown of any king or queen then she immediately turned round and walked again towards the town and he saw her no more what art thou looking so eagerly after again asked storrade but when king olaf now turned to the queen she appeared to him old and ugly and full of the world's sin and wickedness and he was terrified at the thought that he might have fallen into her snares he had taken off his glove to give her his hand but he now took the glove and threw it in her face instead i will not own thee foul woman and heathen dog that thou art he said then storrade drew backwards but she soon regained the command over herself and answered that blow may prove thy destruction king olaf tryggveson and she was white as hail when she turned away from him and went on board her ship next night king olaf had a strange dream what he saw in his dream was not the earth but the bottom of the sea it was a greyish green field over which there were many fathoms of water he saw fish swimming after their prey he saw ships gliding past on the surface of the water like dark clouds and he saw the disk of the sun dull as a pale moon then he saw the woman he had seen at the church door wandering along the bottom of the sea she had the same stooping gait and the same worn garments as when he first saw her and her face was still sorrowful but as she wandered along the bottom of the sea the water divided before her he saw that it rose into pillars as if in deep reverence forming itself into arches so that she walked in the most glorious temple suddenly the king saw that the water which surrounded the woman began to change colour the pillars and the arches first became pale pink but they soon assumed a darker colour the whole sea around was also red as if it had been changed into blood at the bottom of the sea where the woman walked the king saw broken swords and arrows and bows and spears in pieces at first there were not many but the longer she walked in the red water the more closely they were heaped together the king saw with emotion that the woman went to one side in order not to tread upon a dead man who lay stretched upon the bed of green seaweed the man who had a deep cut in his head wore a coat of mail and had a sword in his hand it seemed to the king that the woman closed her eyes so as not to see the dead man she moved towards a fixed goal without hesitation or doubt but he who dreamt could not turn his eyes away he saw the bottom of the sea covered with wreckage he saw heavy anchors thick ropes twined about like snakes ships with their sides riven asunder golden dragon heads from the bows of ships stared at him with red threatening eyes i should like to know who has fought a battle here and left all this as a prey to destruction thought the dreamer everywhere he saw dead men they were hanging on the ship's sides or had sunk into the green seaweed but he did not give himself time to look at them for his eyes were obliged to follow the woman who continued to walk onwards at last the king saw her stop at the side of a dead man he was clothed in a red mantle 
had a bright helmet on his head, a shield on his arm, and a naked sword in his hand. The woman bent over him and whispered to him as if awaking someone sleeping. King Olaf, King Olaf! Then he who was dreaming saw that the man at the bottom of the sea was himself. He could distinctly see that he was the dead man. As the dead did not move, the woman knelt by his side and whispered into his ear, Now Storrode hath sent her fleet against thee and avenged herself. Dost thou repent what thou hast done, King Olaf? And again she asked, Now thou sufferest the bitterness of death, because thou hast chosen me instead of Storrode. Dost thou repent? Dost thou repent? Then at last the dead opened his eyes, and the woman helped him to rise. He leant upon her shoulder, and she walked slowly away with him. Again King Olaf saw her wonder and wonder, through night and day, over sea and land. At last it seemed to him that they had gone further than the clouds and higher than the stars. Now they entered a garden where the earth shone as light and the flowers were clear as dewdrops. The king saw that when the woman entered the garden she raised her head and her step grew lighter. When they had gone a little further into the garden, her garments began to shine. He saw that they became as of themselves, bordered with golden braid and colored with the hues of the rainbow. He saw also that a halo surrounded her head that cast a light over her countenance. But the slain man who had leant upon her shoulder raised his head and asked, Who art thou? Dost thou not know, King Olaf? she answered and an infinite majesty and glory encompassed her but in the dream king olaf was filled with a great joy because he had chosen to serve the gentle queen of heaven it was a joy so great that he had never before felt the like of it and it was so strong that it awoke him when king olaf awoke his face was bathed in tears and he lay with his hands folded in prayer end of section 11 read by lars rolander